Okay, uh, hello everyone. Welcome to this uh, live stream. Today is exciting. We are launching version 12.3 of Wolfram Language and Mathematica. And uh, so I get to, for the first time, kind of officially play with the new system out in public. And that's what I'm gonna be doing here in this live stream. So it's kind of hard to believe we've been doing this for 35 years, releasing new versions of what's now Wolfram Language and essentially building sort of a taller and taller tower of technology. And it's really been a remarkable experience and journey. In a sense, to a higher level, that tower of technology, we get to see even further about what we can do. And then we build further based on what we can see. And that's the cycle that we've been on for, for 35 years now. And uh, so what we've been doing recently is bringing out integer versions of our system in a, a, in a place where sort of lots of new frameworks are fully complete. But we also want to deliver incremental versions of the technology that we're producing, and those are the point one releases. And our current point one releases are huger than most of the, um, uh, um, uh, the, the, the whole integer releases that we were doing, I don't know, 30 years ago or something now. So uh, we have a remarkable rate of uh, new product development and innovation that we're delivering. Uh, it's been just five months since we delivered version 12.2 of Wolfram Language. 12.3 um, is, uh, uh, is a very in interesting and important step forward. It is not an integer release. It doesn't have lots of big frameworks that have been all fully tied up more I see it as being a finishing and polishing of things that have been partly developed before and an indication of some of the big frameworks that are to come. And those indications are already extremely useful, but they're not up to our sort of standards of completion that would justify them being in an integer release, so to speak. So a thing we've been very keen to do is we're just, we, we just want to make what we have, we've defined a certain set of functionality. We want to make it uh, better, stronger, faster than, than ever before. We want to fix the bugs that have been found. We want to round out the features. We want to improve the heuristics. We want to make it so that when there's a sort of a corner that uh, is an obvious one to go in, yes, we've actually covered that and so on. Um, so that's quite a bit of what this release is about. Um, there are uh, in this release, it's sort of amazing. In five months, we have 111 completely new functions that are in this release um, that have never been seen before. That's about, um, uh, let's see, what does that work out to be? Um, it's about uh, five new functions per development week. So it's essentially um, not that we work on a, on a, um, uh, a five-day schedule by any means in each week, but that's uh, roughly... Um, one new function for every business day for the time that we've been developing this, uh, this new version. So I consider that rather, rather impressive. Now, as, as many of you will know, one of the things that I consider interesting about our development process is this very open development process that we've been following, where we've been live streaming our design review meetings, talking about all these new features that we're thinking about, about implementing, uh, reviewing the designs for them, reviewing in some cases their implementation and so on. And I hope uh, some of you have been able to participate in that kind of open development process. Um, I think it's something quite unlike what uh, anybody else has been, has been doing or perhaps has even been able to do given the kind of uh, the thing that we've signed up to do, which is to make the world's only full-scale computational language which is a thing that requires not just, oh, I'm going to make a version of the language and it's going to be done in six months. It's something that requires, we're just, there's, there's just so much, there's sort of an infinite frontier of things to add to our sort of full-scale computational language. And that's why we're at 35 years and counting in the process of doing it. But it's also something where we have on uh, uh, every, every day, we have interesting design issues that have never come up before that we now have to solve to, to, to go forward on this, on this uh, kind of long journey of making a full-scale computational language. All right, so in terms of today, uh, I'm happy to say 12.3 is, is out and about everywhere. 
and um, um, the um, uh, it um, uh, we um, we have uh, versions out on uh, both the desktop Mathematica and Wolfram One and the cloud. Uh, actually, for people who are very observant, and I know a few people noticed this, the cloud got updated a few days ago. So the cloud was running 12.3 even before the desktop version was available for download. Um, the, uh, uh, we also have the Wolfram Engine, which is, uh, which is, being, um, um, uh, which is coming out um, uh, also uh, today, I believe. There's already a question on our live stream about Apple Silicon and uh, native Apple versions. Um, what is in 12.3 is a uh, version using the Rosetta compatibility layer for, for the Mac. Uh, we are working hard and we're hoping in 12.3.1, we will be able to deliver a native version. The main issue is we have a lot of different tentacles in the system. Uh, for example, areas of machine learning where we're using kind of optimized libraries, uh, lots of different kinds of areas. I believe we're down to two and two or three tentacles, which are still hanging on, not yet able to be converted to native uh, Apple technology. But but um, uh, that will be available soon. Um, and uh, uh, I, I'm, I, I notice uh, the um, uh, apparently we have pre-release versions of the um, uh, native uh, version ready to go. They're not yet um, uh, tested. Um, uh, let's see, and there's already another comment here about um, uh, the download manager tool. I would think we have the download manager uh, up and running. I believe that's how you download things from our user portal. Um, maybe somebody can comment on that. Um, but, uh, and um, uh, by the way, if you have an Apple Silicon machine, uh, we are keen to get pre-release testers for that version. So uh, please do sign up for that. Um, ah, the download manager updates are coming soon. So that, that, that definitely has not gone away. All right, well, without further ado, let's, let's get down to actually uh, trying some things out in the new version 12.3. Uh, uh, one more comment actually, which is that um, in addition to all the things that have happened in, um, uh, the actual core system that's been being developed. Uh, we also have things like the function repository, and there's even much more functionality that's being added there. It's, it's really a fascinating kind of funnel that we have at this point, uh, where we have functionality that is sort of being prototyped in the function repository, and you can use it there, and everybody can access it there, but it isn't as sort of complete and robust as the kind of thing that we will put into our main product, but to make something complete and robust will take longer, maybe even take the invention of new algorithms, new methods, and so on, new designs. Um, but you can get it now in the function repository as kind of a prototype. And then maybe in a time from six months to year to a few years, it'll be available in the main system. And we're going through an active process right now of looking at some of the, the uh, most powerful and interesting functions in the function repository to try and sort of promote them to core system functions. And uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of different things. Um, uh, we, we found the same kind of process with uh, going from now the data repository to things like data and Wolfram Alpha, and then going from there to things in the language. And you'll see a few of those in what I'm talking about today in 12.3, and there's much more that's, uh, that's in the pipeline. Okay, well, let's actually take a look at, um, uh, let's actually take a look at it. All right, let me um, uh, go here. And um, all right, so let's start off with, with one of the things that I always find important about uh, successive versions, but that, which is just adding all the kind of little conveniences that make it really smooth to use the system. So, uh, Let's um, let's start off looking at a few of those. So let, let's start with a very a very basic convenience. Okay, so we solve an equation. Here we go. All right. So one thing I often want to do is just let me use the let me use the results of solving that equation. And and what we've always done is and it's very general and very nice is to say something like this. Uh, you know, x squared plus one. X goes to the set of rules that are provided there. 
and um, uh, what did I do? Oh my gosh, what a terrible thing! I didn't didn't I, I did something silly here. I'm just I, I say use those rules, and there I get the results. But uh, and that's very general because we can say not just uh, what's the what is the value of x corresponding to the solution to this equation, but what are uh, what's the value of some arbitrary uh, function using the solution to the equation. Okay, but in version uh, 12.3, we've added a, the function solve values, which is kind of a, a cheap way of just getting a list of values of the results. Now, obviously there are lots of corner cases to that that work in more complicated ways, but if you just have an equation, you kind of know it's gonna have a bunch of solutions. I just want a list of the solutions. This is the thing to use. And that's just a, a simple convenience. Um, let's see, people are asking, can I zoom in even further? Let me zoom in even further here. Here we go. Um, okay, same thing with nsolve, uh, just convenience function uh, to, um, to just get the values of solving the equation. Okay, another example of a, of a little convenience, so to speak. Um, sometimes you say, okay, I want the, uh, the um, uh, 20th digit of pi. Okay, well, I can get it by using real digits. I do it to 20 digits. I extract the 20th digit and so on. But now in version 12.3, uh, there's a function number digit. Actually, this function was originally in the function repository. It got its design a little bit cleaned up and now it's a system function. It just says, what's the coefficient of 10 to the minus uh, uh, 10 here in the, um, uh, um, in the decimal expansion of pi? So just a, a little convenience function again. Um, the, uh, okay, let, let's look at another thing. Um, here's an example. Uh, let's say I generate the subsets of the, of the, of the set ABCD there's a list of subsets. Now notice that the order that these subsets have been sorted into is one that goes from shortest subset, uh, shortest subset first. If these subsets were written out as strings, this wouldn't be the correct lexicographic order. And so one of the things that we've added in version um, uh, 12.3 is just a convenient way to do a lexicographic sort of lists as we might do a lexicographic sort for strings. So you'll see kind of the important thing is that A comes before B in the alphabet, rather than that the string B is shorter than the string AB. So again, just a little convenience. Um, another one that's, um, that's in the category of little conveniences, we added the function take drop. If you're doing operations on strings, it's sometimes useful to be able to say, give me a piece that I can uh, can do one thing to and, and what's left over. Uh, kind of when, if you're doing string rewriting, actually I realize this is uh, something which would be very convenient for some functions that we often write in uh, for our physics project. Um, it's like, this is the thing we're gonna do something to, this is the residue. So it's just another small convenience. Um, and uh, yeah, as an example of how that works, um, the function fold pair list, which is one of our more advanced and fairly recent functional programming constructs. Um, this is just allowing you to use this to break up that list into the blocks of these sizes. All right, there are, there are a bunch of other of these sort of little conveniences. Here's one, um, this is just, uh, we had a way of generating the vertex out component for a, um, what on earth happened here? Um, what is this doing? Why is that not a graph? Well, it looks like a graph to me. Um, okay, let's uh, let's say random graph. Um, let's say twenty, uh, thirty here. And let's just let's just evaluate that random graph in place, um, and then let's do the same thing. Okay, so this is just showing. This is the, the nodes that you can get to by going four steps um, out from a given node. Um, it's just a convenient thing to, to be able to get the graph rather than just the labels of the nodes. Okay, again, more of these just little conveniences. Each one of these things is just something where uh, when, you, when you say, oh, I just want this out component graph, well, now there's a function that just does that. and You don't have to make sort of an idiom to, uh, to get it. So this is... Um, 
uh, highlighting an image by morphological components. Again, something where highlight image could take various different specifications of how to highlight it. Morphological components is a way of labeling different components with an integer, and now that can be used to, um, uh, to, to color it. Another really, really simple thing, red. Okay, let's say I want to find, I want to make this in, um, uh, I want to get that in hue space. This is, a, this is an RGB space here. Um, I want to get it in hue space, little convenience. That thing there is now a hue based color. Um, let's see, another, another kind of thing that, um, uh, that we've added. So, so here's a, a general kind of uh, 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 issue. You're doing a computation. It's taking a long time. Um, what, um, uh, what's going on when it's doing the computation? So there's a framework that isn't quite finished. What on earth is that? Um, the uh, this isn't quite finished, but we're we're just um, we're we're steadily installing progress monitoring in all sorts of functions in the system. So in this particular case, we're doing a video map that's doing color conversion on a collection of frames in, uh, in this video. And we're seeing it's saying, uh, it, it's giving us that, that sort of standardized progress monitor. And you'll see, we're not finished with that. We just started with that in version 12.3. You'll see these kinds of standardized progress monitors showing up all over the place in, comp in long computations. Um, let's see, uh, uh, there's a question from, uh, Jesse here. Can number digit compute arbitrary base 16 digits of pi using the digit extraction algorithm? Good idea. Not done yet. Um, ah, question from coupling. Uh, how did I evaluate something within the, uh, input there? Um, it's, it's, this is a standard thing that's existed actually since version one of Wolfram language. If I just say f of one plus one comma two plus two or something, and I select that sub expression and I press on a Mac, it's command return. It'll evaluate in place. That's just a, you can, you can get it from the menus here. It's evaluate in place right after the standard evaluate cells. Um, Okay, well, let's see, some more, uh, some more kind of conveniences. Let me show you something um, uh, about data set. So uh, data set is very powerful function. Uh, we started a couple of versions ago, really working on sort of the, the formatting of data sets, but something that's new in, in version 12.3 is the concept of data set themes. So just as we have plot themes, that make plots where a bunch of kind of choices have been made about how the plot will be rendered. So we have the same kind of thing for data set. So for example, here we have a data set theme alternating column backgrounds. Okay, you see the result from that. Um, uh, alternating column backgrounds, light green, you see the result. Um, there's, uh, uh, there's, there's we, we've got all sorts of uh, data set themes that you can use to kind of, um, uh, conveniently get your data set to have, um, uh, you, you, you've been able to specify for since version 12.1 or 12.2, in detail, I want these particular columns to have these particular colors and so on. This is a theme, which is sort of a bank switching of those kinds of capabilities. Okay, another framework kind of thing that's happening is, um, uh, well, let me show you a couple of things here. Um, Something that's been a very successful function for us is um, our uh, iconize functionality. So what does iconize do? Iconize can take, uh, let's say I don't wanna show this whole section of this list. What I can do is select that section of the list and then say uh, un or iconize selection. And there I'll get the iconized version if I evaluate this, it's just the same as it was before. If I say uniconize, I'll get just the same as I did before, but it's a way of storing uh, data in a notebook in this iconized form. So 
uh, something that's come in this version is, is just a little bit more on, on making sure that you can, you don't have to really nail precisely where you put your cursor. It's going to figure out how to make a reasonable expression that uh, can be uh, can be iconized, even if you included that loose comma or something like that um, in, in what you selected. Okay, another thing that's, um, that's new and quite important is, is this. Let's say I make a sparse array of 10 million elements. Okay. What I get out here is a what we call a summary box, um, just sort of a summary of this is a sparse array. It's got 10 million elements, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It probably has some more information about it. Um, but the important thing is, if I were to take this object and um, uh, use it in a different session, if I were to just save this notebook, close down the session kernel, restart it, that data would not be preserved by default. The data has not automatically been stored in the notebook. But this now is, a, again, a standardized framework that we're going to be using in a lot of places um, that uh, allows you to specify that you want it stored. So it says, unless you store the data, 160 megabytes, it will not be available when you quit the kernel. OK. Um, oh, this is unfortunately still small, but I'll read to you what it says. So when you say store now, there are three choices it gives you. Embed inline in the notebook. That means this notebook will have 160 megabytes of data in it. That is sort of backing this particular summary box. Store in a local object. That's stored in the file system of your local computer or store in the cloud. Now, if I say store in the cloud, I think it will give me an option here. Does it do that? Or is it just storing that 160 megabytes in my cloud account? It may be just storing the 160 megabytes. I thought it was going to give me an option about whether I wanted that to be uh, to be available to other people or not, whether I just wanted that for myself. Um, maybe that option comes up later. It's not super smart to store this 160 megabytes probably in the cloud for these purposes. Um, all right, so that's another example of, um, uh, of a framework that's coming uh, is this always allow output that isn't where what you see is sort of just a handle to the output, always give you a way to explicitly store that output. If I had stored it in the cloud, then it would have had a cloud URL here. And if I email this notebook to somebody, then assuming that they had access to that cloud URL, uh, they too could get access to this data. Okay. So there's one category of thing, little conveniences, little filling out of different kinds of functionality. Another thing that's been a big emphasis for us is just make everything faster. Everybody always likes things getting faster. You know, I might have wished that computers would generically have gotten faster than they have, um, but uh, uh, we can do more and we can do more of what computers can do, like uh, ability to multi-thread, GPUs, things like that. We can do more to make use of computers as they are to make things faster, and we can do more in our core system to just make things faster. So one of the big general things that's allowing things to be made faster is our compiler technology. We've had a project for the last uh, six or seven years now to build a kind of uh, a new generation symbolic compiler for Wolfram Language that is essentially compiling, compiling directly from Wolfram Language to LLVM and from that out to raw machine code for different machines. That's a huge project to be able to compile our whole language, but we're making use of the compiler in stages um, and one of the first sort of customers for, the, for that compiler is our internal code itself. Uh, so for example, here's an example of something that was enabled by the compiler. Um, the, uh, this is, so let, let, me, let me run this computation. Let me just start up. Oh boy, where do I have a, oh my gosh, where is a, a um, in all my, all my icons here, I don't know where there's a, a 12.2. Let me go. Let me go hunt for a, a version 12.2. That's that's old news. Uh, I'm I'm. Um, uh, hold on one second here. I need to uh, go find myself a previous version. Um. Ba -ba 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 -ba. Uh, hmm. That was a that was an unexpected glitch here. That um that I'm I'm always modernizing and I now my uh, I have the current version which is as of today 12.3. And I have a 12.3.1 or a 12.4 version as well, but I also 
now I'm looking for my um, uh, general, um, uh, let me see, 12, um, uh, 12.2, 12 because I want to show you a comparison here. Um, uh, maybe somebody from our internal group can find out where I can get that from. Um, uh, let's see. Um, well, let's see. All right. I'm going to, um, maybe I'll just, uh, uh, gosh, this is a, this is a weird embarrassment that, um, let me see if I just ask for, um, Um, let me see. Okay, I am trying to navigate. Uh, how would I do that? Hmm. Um, Well, maybe I, um, hard to believe that I, let's see. Oh yeah, I know it is suggesting dollar installation directory here. Let's see. Uh, well, that's nice. Um, okay. Um, all right, one, one last place to try here. And then um, uh, my best planned, um, hmm. what was that? That's very weird. Uh, Let's see. Okay, one one last place to try, and then we we give up on this. Um, yeah, we'll we'll have to give up here. Okay. Well, what I was going to show you, and and I had written about it in um, the post that I wrote here, uh, is um, let me just uh, give you the um, um, this is what happened in version. Um, uh, 12.2 for that computation. And let's um, go ahead and uh, this, is, this is the result. So around, remember, represents um, a, uh, um, a number with errors. So this is saying we're picking a random real number with errors 0 0.001. And now let me do the same computation here um, with, uh, let me do the same computation as I was doing in 12.2 here. Um, and look at that. It's, it took 1.3 seconds there. It now takes 0.02 seconds. How was that achieved? It's running 100 times faster. Um, it's, uh, that was achieved because the internal code of a round is now fully compiled and turned into machine code and, um, uh, and able to run at sort of full machine speed. So lots of reasons why things got faster. Another example is the function permanent, which got faster because of an algorithm update. Um, that uh, it's an algorithm that some, some of these are algorithms that we've invented. Some of these are algorithms that have been, um, uh, 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 have, have uh, come into the literature. Um, I want to mention um, the, uh, another very practical thing that got faster is the rasterize function. If I take um, uh, taking, um, um, uh, being able to, uh, let's take one of these, for example, um, it's now faster, and this is something that is important for uh, various kinds of external applications of the language. That is now, that's an image that has been, um, you probably see it, uh, be it showing its rasterness. If we make it big enough, um, that's now gotten substantially faster. Um, another thing 
that's uh, uh, faster and, and interesting is our whole data structure functionality. This is again, something made possible by, um, uh, by the compiler um, and uh, the, um, this is, um, uh, let's see, we want to take, um, let, let me show you an example here. Um, we've added a number of new data structures uh, to the collection of built-in data structure objects that are again enabled by the compiler. So this is a byte try. So this is something useful for prefix kinds of um, uh, prefix trees and so on. We've also added something called immutable vector, which is quite similar to an ordinary Wolfram language list, except that it is uh, set up to be um, uh, something that allows rapid appending. So it doesn't have to, it's, it's not stored as a separate thing in memory, it's stored as something that can be, it's not mutable, it's immutable, but it is fast to append to. So um, those, are, those are some other kind of uh, speed increase kinds of things. All right, I'm going to kind of follow the, the, the post that I wrote um, that was posted just today. Um, and the next thing that I talked about there was math. Um, we're always pushing the math frontier. Uh, Mathematica, originally described as a system for doing mathematics by computer. Um, I think we've expanded what mathematics means to some extent. Didn't, mathematics didn't expand nearly as much as the expansion that we've seen in Wolfram Language, which is why uh, we've kind of preferred the Wolfram Language name for what we're doing rather than the Mathematica name, because we're not just about what math is about today. We're about this much more general idea of computational language. But we're always keen to expand on, um, uh, on, on, the, on doing math. Let me give you an example of something that got added um, is the concept of um, um, uh, Equation solving. So uh, this is something that um, we we now have this mechanism where we show these these are exact numbers, um, but they're implicitly represented exact numbers. And these are, if I say what's the input form of this, you'll you'll see explicitly these are root objects, but they're transcendental root objects, and. Um, uh, the, the, the thing that's new here um, is the ability to work with mu uh, multivariate transcendental roots. So these things, this is an implicitly defined number that is defined in terms of the solution to this two variable equation. And so for example, in line 38, I can say evaluate learn 38 to you know, 300 digit precision, and we can just do that because those things are really exact numbers just implicitly represented. And so we can go ahead and evaluate them to whatever precision we want, or if some combination of them might be something that we could simplify to another exact number, and this would allow us to do that as well. Um, okay, there are, there are things, um, let's see, what else do we have here? This is uh, uh, Jacobi elliptic functions being able to bring those into the context of our equation solving mechanisms. Um, it's always a, a, an interesting challenge when we introduce new mathematical functions, sort of having them be used everywhere they can, whether it's for results of integrals, whether it's in differential equations, whether it's in equation solving. This is just another example of, of so what is the solution to this Jacobi elliptic function equal to one? Oh, it's these, uh, 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 ordinary elliptic integrals. So, um, okay, another big thing, this has been a long story, uh, differential equations, ordinary differential equations. Can we solve any linear system of ODEs with rational function coefficients? Okay, we now can. And uh, that's been a, a long time coming and there, that's one that comes out in terms of Bessel functions. I suspect, you know, let's live dangerously. I'm gonna make one random little tiny change here and see what happens. Okay, that's a, that's a, that didn't have that much effect. Okay, let, let's, uh, let's live even more dangerously. Let's just put a random thing in here. Let's say T squared plus one, I may regret this horribly. Grind, 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 what's it gonna do? 
Uh, it's very hard to predict how complicated a result will be um, in something like this. But the main point is this is now in principle possible. One day we will have a progress monitor that shows us roughly what's happening as it's trying to do this computation. Let's, let's let that thing crunch for a while. Oh, let's not, let's give up. I don't know, I don't know. How, oh, there we go. Oh, look at that. Oh, this is very exotic. It's full of, um, okay, so this has, is a differential root object that is the implicit, is a function that is implicitly the solution of a particular differential equation. So this has kind of untangled this computation to be one that can be represented in terms of these differential root objects. Um, okay, so let's see. Um, we've also got, uh, here's some, uh, some more equation solving. This is now, um, this is now one that has uh, uh, that has explicitly constructed uh, integrals in the solution to the differential equation. Um, there are uh, okay if you're if you're into differential equations, there are Q rational function coefficients. This is one with it, which is a Q rational, so it involves an exponential like that as well. And uh, again, we can we should be able to solve this. Um, in fact. One of the things that's new in um, in twelve point three, there's a there's a very long story um, about. Uh, boy, I think I made a typo in my. Um, oh no, I didn't. Um, uh, there's a, there's a very long story about about um, uh, in, in version twelve point two, we introduced this idea of um, um, uh, having sort of a modeling language to represent solutions to uh, uh, PDEs that involve, for example, a heat equation and explicitly representing the boundary conditions for you know, heat sources and absorbers and all that kind of thing. Well, those same ideas that we can use for numerical partial differential equations, we can also use for the cases where we can solve a symbolic partial differential equation and in version 12.3, there's a hundred and something page uh, monograph that describes what you can do with the modeling language with symbolic PDEs. I suspect this will be very useful for the cases where it is possible to get a symbolic solution and also for many educational applications where one is mostly interested in the cases where for one reason or another, one's able to state um, solutions um, symbolically. But so this is a, this is a, a, a quite um, extensive discussion of, um, uh, of symbolic PDEs in the context of the modeling language. Okay, so let's see. Um, continuing. Uh, oh yeah, it looks like I have an example here. Um, all right, so this is an equation represented using our Laplacian, using that, that's, um, that's the Laplacian. So this is, um, uh, so here's an equation. And now uh, I can go ahead and set, so that's sort of using the, a simple version of our modeling language. Um, let's uh, go ahead and solve that. So now we're in a position, hopefully, to solve that uh, PDE that's been stated in terms of our modeling language, we can solve that symbolically now in terms of hypergeometric functions. Actually notice that that has a piecewise, let, let's look at this in traditional form. Maybe we can, uh, maybe that will be a little bit easier to read. Okay, there we go. So, so this has, uh, we can see here in, in one case, it is um, uh, for this case, it's this value. Otherwise, it's in the, in, in the case where the, those conditions are not satisfied, the result is indeterminate. Um, okay, here's another, another example. Um, this is, uh, what is this creature? Um, okay, this is, this is more uh, um, adding different kinds of solutions for nonlinear PDEs, uh, symbolic solutions for nonlinear PDEs. It's, it's extremely difficult and usually not possible to find a general solution to a nonlinear PDE, um, but we can find certain special solutions to nonlinear PDEs, and, and this is an example of that. Um, okay, again, uh, the um, again, sort of rounding things out. These are bilateral Laplace transforms. 
uh, useful for signal processing. Uh, we've also got um, uh, in, in version 12.3, we continue our sort of long uh, additions to, um, uh, um, uh, to the world of special functions. And um, one of the functions, long awaited functions is the Fox H function, which is a very general hypergeometric style function that um, allows us to represent a whole class of new integrals, equations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, symbolically in terms of the Fox H function. Um, there are also the Carl synoleptic integrals as another, uh, as another, another class of functions added in, in 12.3. Again, each one of these functions, not only do we have to be able to evaluate this function to arbitrary precision anywhere in the complex plane, we also have to, let, let's see what happens if I, I'm gonna live dangerously here. I'm gonna put some variable X in there. I'm just gonna say, differentiate this creature with respect to X. And okay, it's gonna do some, it didn't do anything very useful here. Maybe it doesn't have a well-defined, it may not have a well-defined derivative with respect to that. But uh, even if I say, evaluate that for with, um, a particular value here, let's say one half to 50. Again, I'm living dangerously because I have really no idea. Okay, there we go. That was nice. Um, but the fact that that's possible and that uh, whatever I feed in here can be computed, that's a huge amount of work to make that work for a very complicated function like the Fox H function. We have a question on the live stream from Demetrius about um, general frameworks for integral differential equations. You know, for 30, three years, I would say, integral differential equations come up with some regularity. And every time we say, there isn't really a general way to do that, where, you know, that we don't really have a good way to approach those. So I think integral differential equations, I think there may be some things in the function repository for them. Um, uh, I don't think that's been a thing. We, we'd love to know about um, people's interest in prioritizing certain kinds of integral differential equations. Um, but that's not yet a thing. Something that is coming, by the way, is fractional differentiation, and that will relate to integral differential equations. That didn't quite make it into version 12.3, but I think it's slated for the next version. Uh, all right, well, keeping going here, um, something we've added in, in version 12, big thing we added in version 12 was uh, really industrial strength convex optimization, something important for many practical applications. Um, we've now been able to add uh, the capability to do um, uh, um, 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 uh, uh, we've we've um, um, been um, uh, we, well, actually I, I'm, I'm going to go back on something I just said. I uh, Roger Germanson is is uh, here with us. Maybe he can uh, speak to this point. Roger is commenting that dsolve already solves integral differential equations. Uh, what's a good example of that? Let's see, if we go to dsolve, um, see, this is what, uh, uh, there I was thinking we couldn't do this. Let me see. I suspect there will be an example in scope. Let's take a look. Oh, look at all those different kinds of things. All right, so we've got differential algebraic equations. We've got integral equations. Here we go. So let's go to these. Solve a Volterra integral equation. Okay, so so uh, okay, that's a pure integral equation. Wow, I didn't know this worked. Did I know this worked? I don't know. The um, look at that. Fancy that we can solve that. Now let's see. Can we solve one that also involves a derivative? Looks like we can. Here we go. How long have we been able to do this? Um, millions of years, probably. Well, there, good, good to know that there's more that we can do than I knew about. Okay, so there's an integral differential equation. Very nice. That's a much better answer than, um, uh, than I thought we could give to that. All right. I, I don't know how general this, these integral differential equation capabilities are, um, but, uh, See, now, now I'm going to live dangerously. And of course, I'm going to just break the whole thing because I'm going to add like an x squared here. Oh, wow. Came out in terms of a differential root object. Very nice. Um, very nice. And no doubt if I give it a boundary condition, 
See, I, I always have to live dangerously here. Um, let's say I give that boundary condition. Okay, still works. I guess the boundary condition is part of the, uh, of the differential. Yeah, I can see it there as part of the differential root object. Um, okay, back to my um, uh, main narrative here. Uh, we added these convex optimization capabilities to version 12. A big thing in version 12.3 is being able to do those kinds of convex optimization problems, not just numerically, but also symbolically. And often things get very complicated, but this is a case where what we're seeing is a function that has broken into many cases. We're saying, find the minimum value of this polynomial object with these constraints. These are various linear constraints here. And what we see is that, that, that it's broken, depending on the value of A and B, we're breaking into a variety of different, uh, different parts. And for example, here we can just go ahead and plot the result here for that minimum value as a function of A and B. And what we'll see here is we'll see that the, that the system broke it up into these different subregions that correspond to different combinations of A and B. I think this is a really powerful thing. It's something we figured out how to do for, for 12.3. Um, uh, we can do that also for things like geometric optimization. So here's a case where we're now, again, using differential root objects to solve this problem uh, with respect to, uh, so, so we've got um, this here. If we say what's the numerical value here, I can compute the numerical value to 100 digit precision, for example, that's the minimum value of that. Um, but this is effectively a symbolic result that uses these implicit root objects here. Okay, moving right along. Next area I wanted to talk about is graphs. And one thing that I could have really used in, our, uh, in the physics project is layered graph plot 3D. So this is now making a um, Kairi uh, tree uh, with 255 um, uh, um, uh, leaves. And it's now making a layered graph plot of that. I'm sure if I try a, um, just a random, uh, let's see. Um, uh, I'm thinking how to make a random directed graph. Let's say we make a random graph, um, let's say 50 and 100, and let's say directed edges to true. I wonder what this will do. That's a big mess. But we can see there, it's now making a layered graph plot 3D showing something where we're trying to turn this into essentially a partial ordering. Um, this is actually, this is very beautiful. I haven't kind of tried doing this before. Uh, you know, welcome to sort of a world of, of uh, a foliation of, of space time or something of, of, a, of one of our causal graphs in the physics project. This, this kind of does that in, in just uh, one line here. Okay, another thing that's new in uh, version 12.3 is uh, another form of graph embedding, spherical embedding. Um, so this is a grid graph and let's just put it on a sphere. Um, and uh, this should now give us that grid graph uh, where it's now laid out on the surface of a sphere. I'm kind of curious what will happen if I give it a um, random graph uh, with 100 nodes, 50, uh, no, let's say, let's say 100 nodes, 200 edges, and lay that out on the surface of a sphere. Okay, it wasn't, didn't look that exciting, um, but this is now uh, just a, a, a new form of graph embedding. Uh, probably coming soon will be um, um, a hyperbolic embedding as well as spherical embedding. Um, Okay, next thing is spanning trees. So we've been able to make spanning trees from graphs for ages. Um, new thing here is being able to make spanning trees from anything where we might reasonably think there would be a spanning tree to be made. So for example, here, we're going to make a spanning tree based on the um, uh, cities in Europe. And um, let's see, if we go in here and um, uh, these uh, and what, what it will have done is to make the spanning tree based on the geopositions of those cities. Okay, so given that we've now got a nice graph here, let's uh, let's do something else, which is which is new in version twelve point three, which is geo graph plot. So geo graph plot takes a graph um, that has as its nodes geopositions and then draws the resulting graph on on a on a um, uh, on a geo 
um, uh, on 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 the globe. Uh, actually, I'm I'm very curious if I were to do a um, okay just for fun, just to show generality, so to speak. Let's do a um, uh, I'm now just again going to live dangerously. Let's say I say, oops, what is happening here? Come on, wake up. There we go. Um, no, not what I wanted. Um, let's say I say Apollo landing sites. So I'm, I'm now just curious, is this all going to work as I hope it would? And um, uh, let's see whether that's right. Ah, this has to say, um, let's see, if I say landing, landing position. Okay, let's try that. That was really boring. That was, a, that was the most boring spanning tree I've seen in a long time. But let's see what happens if I say geograph plot of that. Oh, oh, terrible, terrible. It didn't, um, well, clearly wrong planet there. So let's see if we go, um, um, if we go there. That, that's kind of showing us that the uh, things landed close to the zero, zero point that's on the face of the moon that uh, 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 faces towards us. But let's say we, um, um, let's try this. There we go. That looks a bit more convincing. Uh, the spanning tree wasn't very exciting in this case. Um, anyway, so uh, geograph plot. Let, let's try another variation here. Let's say um, we get geograph plot of line 68 which was our, our capital cities in Europe. Um, and let's say that the graph layout that we want to use is, um, let's say it is uh, driving. Okay, so now instead of giving us these straight lines, th th there's a question when you lay out a graph on, a, on, a, um, on, on, on the geoid, um, how will you actually lay out the edges will they be will they be geodesics shortest paths will they be um what will the um uh um what will the paths uh, how will the part how will the edges be drawn what's happening here why is this taking so long up oh, there we go finally got it oh well that's why it took so long okay so this was actually generating the driving directions between all these different um, uh, places. So instead of just drawing a straight geodesic shortest path, it's drawing the driving path. And I imagine there are a number of ferries involved here. Um, this, uh, this particular one, I, I, we imagine driving to Svalbard or something, but uh, I think it's, it's assuming that there's a, uh, a geodesic ferry um, to be taken uh, to Svalbard here. Um, okay. So that's um, that's another uh, another thing. Let's um, let's go on talking about. Um, we've talked about graphs. Let's talk about geometry. Um, so one thing that we've added is um, the notion of geometric test. Um, we've added in. Um, we have a number of functions that um, uh, in in the case of our synthetic geometry system, we now have the ability to represent many kinds of geometric assertions. Geometric test is kind of an explicit version of a geometric assertion. So for example, here, uh, we, we've already had things like collinear points, which is a function specifically for this case, but we can have more general kinds of things where we can say geometric test, is this polygon convex? Okay, now we have some conditions there. Or more complicated, is this polygon regular? Okay, now we have a bunch of equations that define whether this will be a regular polygon. Um, and uh, uh, now uh, let's try, try an even more complicated case. We've got three circles here, are they tangent? That becomes a question, does there exist a C1 such that whatever? So there's a way to basically take sort of Euclid style geometric constructions and make them Descartes style, turn them into uh, algebra. Um, I noticed Jesse is asking um, uh, the um, is commenting that he avoids non geodesic ferries as much as possible. Uh, yeah, good good point. On the on on the ocean, you surely can go pretty much in a straight line. Um, 
the uh, uh, Jesse is asking, are there plans to support driving directions on the moon? You know, driving directions on the moon are probably a lot easier than they are on the Earth. It's more like the ocean than it is like, uh, uh, because on the Earth, you know, among other things, there's private property on the Earth. You can't just drive anywhere you want. Um, you have to kind of uh, follow the follow the, the collectively produced roads and so on. On the moon, other than maybe one piece that's uh, uh, owned by a friend of mine, actually, that's the area around a particular Russian uh, lunar rover, uh, pretty much the, uh, the moon, by, by any reasonable uh, assumption, is a, um, uh, there's no private property on the moon. So there's no kind of, you can't go there. There's no road that allows you to go from here to there. So I think I think driving directions on the moon is a simpler problem, other than the question of craters and crater rims and are there boulders there. I don't think anybody knows how that works. Um, on Mars, of course, we can just uh, do the helicopter thing, so we don't have to worry about that. Um, uh, we we will soon have. I guess we have the wind direction vectors. Um, and when it comes to these, um, an interesting thing. Somebody should write one of these. Is the geodesic directions here, um, we can ask questions about, um, uh, you know, how, if it's flight paths, how do you get, um, uh, how do you account for the uh, wind vectors and so on and making those flight paths? That will be some interesting kinds of things to, to do. All right, moving along. Um, another thing that's new in, in version 12.3, is region dilation. So region dilation basically is taking a, a structuring element here and dilating, great. Okay, I think this had to do with the way I copied this in. Um, the, uh, it had to, it's, it's, it's taking um, the, uh, let's try this. Great, okay, let's use this trick. All right. Let's try this one. Okay, there we go. All right, so what it's doing is it's taking this element here and it's looking at all possible points in each of these shapes and it's kind of dilating these shapes. It's sort of taking a convolution of this shape with these shapes. It's starting at any point in here and it's saying, where do you get to if you put this shape out from any point in this shape? Why does one care? It's a useful way to make uh, new shapes from old, but it has another interesting use, the so-called piano mover problem. Let's say you want to move a piano that's this shape through these obstructions. Well, you can figure out, will it fit by basically puffing out each of these obstructions by a piano shape? And if there's a path, if there's empty space between these objects, then yes, you can fit your piano through there. And if there isn't, you can't. So uh, you can also use this, as I say, to make, um, uh, let's say we just do this, region translation of a, a disk by a triangle. This is just essentially taking a triangle and uh, sort of convolving a disk with all points in the triangle. Um, okay, now if, if you say, what is that region dilation of a triangle by a disk? Actually, there's a a kind of an algebraic form of that as an implicit region. I'm, of course, because I live dangerously, let's just try this. I'm just curious what happens if I say regular polygon here, let's say a pentagon, is that going to be something that comes back reasonably or is that going to be in, infinitely complicated? A, a, um, a pentagon uh, dilated by, by a disc. It may be that, that uh, it may be this is something where, um, uh, I don't know whether this is a kind of Galois theory should show us that this is hard to do, but um, okay, in any case, we'll, we'll let that, maybe we won't, let's put it out of its misery. I tried something that was too hard. Um, okay, all right, on we go. In version 12.3, new stuff in visualization. Simple thing, list line plot 3D. This is now making a random angle path in 3D. This is kind of your, your flying turtle type type story. Um, now, just list line plot added along with the collection of other functions. And, and you can also do things where you can either join the points like this, or you can say, this is a, um, uh, we're going to have multiple data sets. And now we can make each data set will be separately joined here. 
I mean, I could have done that here. I suppose I could have just said, make a table of um, uh, 10 random uh, ones of these, and we will have got 10, that's kind of nice. Um, we will have got 10 sort of random worms there, AKA flying turtles in the logo sense. All right, another thing that's uh, new in 12.3, stream plot 3D. So we've had, um, we've had stream plots in two dimensions. Now we have uh, stream plots in 3D, so you can make all those nice um, uh, fluid dynamics visualizations and so on uh, directly in the system like this. Um, okay, another thing that is sort of starting to poke its head out in version 12.3 is more general treatment of axes. So when you have a plot, one of the things that's, that's important is put axes on it. So one thing we've done now in 12.3 is we have disembodied symbolic axes. And that's important. If you're going to make a plot, you're going to put three axes on the plot. You're going to have a triangular plot with axes in weird places. How do you deal with that? Well, so now we have an axis object, which is a symbolic specification of an axis. And you can start seeing why things get complicated here. This is an axis that's at 45 degrees and has those particular um, those particular markings on it from zero to 100. We have to say, where do the ticks go? You can have much more exotic axes, like let's say this is a, this is a perfectly good axis for us now, a, a spiral axis. Um, you could say, uh, given, you know, let's say we have a space filling curve. Now we're going to fill in the tick positions. Where do the tick positions go? We want to fill in 50 tick positions here. Let's say we try and fill in 100 tick positions. What's going to happen here? Um, it's going to fill in more positions. It's got to figure out where those ticks go. Let's say I'm just I'm just curious to live dangerously. If we have 200 ticks, uh, where do they? Where does it start to label those ticks and so on? Um, and it, it tries to avoid collision of these ticks. If we were to do the thing here, let's say we say on our spiral axis, again as as usual, living. Um, uh, living somewhat dangerously here. Let's say 200 tick positions. Oh, that's very pretty. Yeah, that was easy. Um, no problem. All right. So generalization of axes. Um, and uh, you know, not only do we have that issue, we also have the issue of um, um, uh, what happens. Okay. So this is another issue. Is given that you're going to put tick positions on a spiral, where should the numbers go? So up here, all the numbers were just straight up, so to speak. All the numbers were just the ordinary orientation. Here, we're saying tick label orientation is parallel. That means the ticks are labeled parallel to the axes. So for example, here, if we say um, the uh, um, uh, tick label orientation parallel in this case, uh, it'll probably do all kinds of weird things. Oh, yeah, that's really exotic. Um, so it's now it's trying to label these ticks to be parallel to this discrete curve. Okay, just just in case you thought, you know, people have been saying, why don't you have multiple axes? Why don't why haven't you generalized the idea of axes? Because it's actually quite hard. Um, so here's another example. This is to, this is saying, let's say we want. Um, uh, oh, this this is actually a different thing. We're off we're off axes now. Um, we're talking about so so axes, very general axes coming, and these will then be supported directly inside all kinds of plots. So you can do multi-axis plots, you can do triangular plots, you can do plots with spirals in them uh, as their axes, and so on. Okay, another topic, another kind of detailed topic that's important is uh, dashing. So that's a dashed line. But um, uh, this is also a dashed line. And oops, our dashing is kind of non-commensurate with the um, uh, with kind of the, 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 the dashes. Uh, we're getting partial dashes. And so one of the things we can do to make partial dashes work more nicely is to say, uh, well, first of all, we're, we're giving a phase for the dashing here. That point one is kind of a phase for the dashing. So if I say P there and I say manipulate that, um, let's say P goes from zero to one, um, I should see uh, I should see the sort of the phase of the dashing. There we go, that's kind of cool. So you see that the, that's determining the phase of the dashing. 
And we can, given a particular dashing phase, we can then say, uh, here, I want to round the ends of my dashes. So now I get something that looks like this, okay? You might say, uh, kind of so what? Um, but here's an example of a so what. This is, uh, let's say you want to have two axes that cross and they're both dashed. You really want it to be the case that the dashing phase agrees where the axes cross. If I were to change that dashing phase here to uh, let's say 0.2 or something, then it's gonna look silly because the, 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 the things are gonna cross in this sort of out of phase point here. Um, let's see, a number of questions here. It's a question from Ali. Can you use 3D regions for region dilation? I am afraid I suspect the answer to that is no right now, but I'm prepared to try it and see. Let us try doing this with a, a cuboid and a, a ball here. Hmm, something, oh, I'm wrong. Wow, cool. Okay, so that's a, a region dilation of, um, of this uh, uh, three-dimensional cuboid with a ball there. I'm, I'm now very curious what would happen if I did, um, uh, what happens if I do something like this? Oh, wow, look at that, that's cool. Um, that's that's uh, sort of dilating with a tetrahedron on a cuboid. I think if I dilate with a cuboid, I'm gonna get some kind of, isn't that equivalent to one of the opera? Oh, that, yeah, I thought it might do that. Um, that. That's equivalent to some kind of polyhedral augmentation operation or something to do things like this. Okay, question from Rohit. Can an axis object take, take a color function to color the axis? Let's find out. Uh, let's go here and let's see if we start typing in color function. Uh, okay, that's a good sign. Uh, no, it doesn't, doesn't seem to be able to. So what, maybe it can take, I think it takes something like that. I'm trying to remember how this works. Let's see. Let's, when in doubt, look at the documentation. Um, okay, there are many different kinds of things it can take. Uh, okay, not currently taking a color function. I believe you can just give it styling for the whole axis, but um, uh, you can't yet, um, uh, make a rainbow axis where the color of the axis changes. Good suggestion. I mean, just to give you a sense again of how complicated things are, you know, these tick directions, I, I talked about tick label orientation. There's the question of the direction of the ticks themselves um, and uh, where the position of the label is relative to the, is, the, is this a, an axis where the labels go below the positions of the ticks or at the points of each of the ticks. This is all a lot of detail that one has to get right to really have uh, uh, sort of these, um, these full symbolic axes. And I don't think these are yet supported in 3D either, where there's even more challenges about just what direction should that axis actually point. Um, let's see. Uh, there's a question from Ali about what bugs have been fixed in version 12.3. There are lists of those, and I wonder what we're, uh, how we're releasing those. It's a good question. Um, maybe somebody can comment on that. All right, moving along. Let's, um, uh, let's see. Um, another thing. This is something we've talked about since version one. It is... Can we make uh, uh, photorealistic um, images of things? So let's say we have a knot and we want to make a golden knot. Well, now we can. This is, this is now using GPU-based uh, uh, material uh, rendering. This is now rendering this material with a... Um, uh, um, uh, with, with the parameters for gold. So we could take, for example, here's another set of parameters we can use. Um, this is, oops, that's not what I wanted. Um, this is uh, uh, material shading for velvet. Um, and that's sort of an imitation velvet that we get there. 
uh, slightly more elaborately, and, and this is showing sort of some of the innards of this, uh, we, we ha will have an increasing library of materials um, that you're able to use. But here's one that we're constructing here. There's a base color, which corresponds to a particular texture. There are surface normals that have a particular texture. There's a roughness coefficient. There's a metallic coefficient. And this is all applied to a sphere. And now we're going to get an armored sphere here. Actually, I have a great urge to just try doing something. Um, oh, let's see. I wonder whether we can do this. Uh, um, I wonder if we say plot style. Let's just see what happens if we try and make a uh, spherical plot 3D of, um, mm, let's see, sine two theta, uh, oops. Um, let's see, cosine phi, cosine phi uh, squared, for example, uh, over theta and phi. Let's see, what will that make? Okay, that makes a weird shaped object. And now let's try taking this whole thing and um, making that a, uh, a plot style for this. Now, I, I think there won't be an issue here because I think, oh boy, it's taking its time to figure out. Okay, uh, come on, wake up, should work. Why is this spinning horribly? Oh, there we go. Okay, so this doesn't look quite as nice as it might because we're still using our standard coloring. Boy, this is giving my GPU some, a bit of a workout here. Um, the, uh, uh, boy, this is, this is really grinding the GPU. Um, but uh, what I didn't do here properly is to, um, uh, is to give it a three-point lighting of the kind that's often used by photographers. This is using our default light sources. And um, uh, to make something which is really photorealistic, you also need photorealistic sort of light sources. And so there are now, there will be a big collection of named light sources. And I'm gonna delete that cell because it is really grinding my GPU. I'm surprised. I think it's, it's what happens if you have all of those surface normals and, and lighting things that have to be computed. Uh, okay. Um, and the, there's a question here. Uh, wow, what's happening? Um, okay, I think this is the life of operating systems do not perfectly schedule GPU operations. Okay, so uh, uh, there's a question about uh, where are these textures listed? That is a good question. Um, oh, the textures here, I think these are just images. And, and we should have a texture library. I mean, one of the things we're working towards is many more small repositories. So just as we have big data repository, big function repository, we're gonna have uh, a repository coming soon of color, uh, um, color maps, uh, repositories of textures and things are a reasonable thing to expect. Um, the, if we look at material shading here, um, we can, uh, um, uh, there are, a bunch of different um, uh, different built-in um, different uh, built-in um, uh, names of materials, but many more will be coming. Um, and uh, let's see. Uh, Jesse is commenting that velvet doesn't really do velvet. Um, uh, a, a service, but he's suggesting that we have to ask, what is the visual? Um, uh, yes, the there we, there we have a a at least velveteen uh, bunny-like object. I wonder if I can. You know, I I I don't know what's happening with the the GPU here. Um, I'm a little bit concerned that things are running outrageously slowly as a result of that. Anyway. Um, so yeah, this whole idea of physically based rendering, there is a whole monograph about that in the, um, uh, um, in the new version, let's see. Um, here we go, physically based rendering monograph about it uh, with a lot of different details about just how 
how the light is really uh, being handled. When light falls on a surface, it can be reflected in all directions, Lambertian um, uh, sort of diffuse reflector. It can be somewhat specular where it has, uh, it's, it's kind of shiny. It can be uh, more like a mirror, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of complicated issues about what the, essentially what the scattering amplitude is um, when light hits a surface. It's kind of, um, uh, it's kind of uh, sort of a scattering theory of the kind you might find in, um, uh, in something like particle physics, except now it's applied to a surface. Um, and so there's a lot of detail here about how that works and how to achieve different kinds of effects um, in, uh, uh, from photorealistic rendering. Okay. Um, the, uh, ah, there's a question from Ali, where do you import these textures from? It's a good question. I, I, you know, we don't have a good, what we should have is a data repository item full of textures. I don't believe we, oh, you know what? We do have one thing. We have an example data. We actually do have textures and example data, as I recall. Um, so we have a collection of textures here. And um, actually now I'm very curious to just say example data map across these. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll get, um, um, oh, come on. What have I managed to make my, um, well, here, let's just get a few of them. Um, let's say, take 113, 10. Um, hopefully that will, okay, so there we go. So there are some, I guess these are black and white textures, but this might be a good place to start. And, and we should provide these in a more packaged form where you can use them in the texture function. Actually, I'm now curious if I take that and uh, I were to use that for my bunny here, and instead of having, um, well, this is using material shading of velvet. Velvet contains some built-in texture, but if I were to do that with uh, some base color and I were to have the, the base color be textured according to that bark texture, I should be able to make a, a, um, uh, um, an arboreal bunny, so to speak. Talking of matters arboreal, the next great thing that I want to talk about is trees. Actually, we had a question here from uh, uh, Gethius about Packlet repository. Um, the, the infrastructure of the Packlet repository is in 12.2. We are building out towards a, um, uh, a public Packlet repository. And um, we have uh, many tools that are being built for that. In fact, to let you in on a secret, some of those tools are already in 12.3. They just have not been advertised yet. And maybe somebody can uh, remind me what the way to, um, uh, uh, to access those hidden, um, not really 12.3 Packlet repository tools is. The most important of those is, which I think is not available yet here, is um, documentation, being able to make rich, documentation for functions and being able to make packet info files. And maybe somebody can point me to, to that, um, those capabilities. Ethan is asking, can we finally export 3D graphics with textures and materials um, intact? Uh, um, I actually don't know the answer to that. Um, oh yeah, this is, a, this is an example uh, that we have here of a, uh, a generated texture. So this is, um, okay, there we go. Um, uh, all right, interesting. Um, um, right, so this is, this is, I guess, a particular, I'm sure we can just run it here because that's the wonder of the, of the um, function repository. You can just access that. By the way, I would like to tell you that one of the things we will have achieved in the Packlet repository is in addition, and I don't think it's in this version yet. Um, let me see if it's hiding there. Oh yes, it is hiding there. Oh, shocking, shocking. Okay, there we go. So this made 
a, um, a, a sort of uh, algorithmically generated texture. Okay, this is a coming attraction. It's not in 12, it, it is in 12.3, but it's not in 12.3, so to speak. We're not documenting it yet in 12.3. This is a thing that allows you to reach in to a packlet and pull out a symbol from it in much the same way as a resource function allows you to uh, go to the global uh, function repository and pull out a function. So this is something that allows you to pull out a single symbol from a packlet without explicitly installing the packlet. Um, okay. So I was, I was saying, I was talking about things arboreal. Big thing in version 12.3 uh, is the arrival of trees as first class objects. Okay, this is a tree. And if you draw it, yes, it's got a little nod to a little, little sort of visual pun. It's a little bit green to reflect the uh, more botan botanical kind of trees. Um, what is a tree? A tree is a nested expression that contains at every, at every piece of a tree is also a tree and it contains a payload for that section of the tree together with the subtrees, okay? So now we can go and we can say, there are many ways to generate a tree. I mean, we could just say random tree of, uh, of 100 elements and we'll get a random tree with 100 elements here. And if we say what actually, um, uh, we can, but we can, and so, so some of these are internal nodes, some of them are, are leaf nodes, but there are many functions that uh, go from other things to trees and from trees to other things. So the typical principle is a rules tree is going to be something that goes from rules and makes a tree. So there we go from rules, A goes to B, C goes to D, E, and so on. It goes from rules and makes a tree. Now, needless to say, tree rules of that goes the other way around. It goes from a tree to make rules. So if I take our big random tree here, line 118, and I say uh, tree rules of line 118, then you'll find there's the, there's the nested rule structure that corresponds to that random tree. Okay, so another, uh, another kind of tree creator is an expression tree. So for example, let's uh, do this integral and I say make an expression tree. Now actually, expression tree has many options that allows you to determine just what you want to sort of uh, fragment out in this tree and what you want to consider to be a, 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 a sort of a, an integral piece. So, so now we can say, show me a tree based on all sub-expressions. So, so now instead of having these uh, intermediate nodes be just single operations, their whole sub-expressions. You can say, make me a tree where the only thing you see is atoms. Um, and now that's, that's showing the intermediate branches here are just uh, sort of blank intermediate branches, but now this is saying it's log of whatever else. Okay, so there, there are different ways of making, even an expression tree has different ways to make it. So for example, if I were to make a list of, um, uh, something like this here, um, then, um, and I could say expression tree of that and um, with atoms here, um, that, that will be what I get. Now there's an also, I think there's a way of making uh, something from lists here that will not explicitly show the list and so on. Um, the, uh, um, um, second. Um, well, let's see. So, so now, um, we can look at, uh, I, I just to, to show how this works. One of the things that's really kind of cool is because a tree just takes a, uh, in this case, okay, the default for a tree is to have no payload, to just have a list of subtrees. So that means that we can have this thing here is a tree because all it's got is these are subtrees 
where the subtrees of the subtree, so to speak, the, 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 the branches of the subtree are themselves trees defined like this. Okay, so, so it's, it's kind of a very nice design, I think, that you just construct trees out of trees by just doing expression nesting. So we can take this, and if we wanted to turn this tree, so this tree is not a graph as such. This tree is just a tree, and we're going to see that there are all kinds of special operations you can do on trees. But if I wanted to, I could turn it into a tree graph, and now it's a graph just like our other kinds of graphs. And I could say, you know, I could say here, tree graph of this, and I could say graph layout, just to do something modern here, I could say graph layout is uh, spherical embedding. Why isn't that auto-completing? That seems like a bud, bug. Um, Oh, uh, what did I do wrong here? Um, and why is that not showing me? Why is that not showing me uh, the, um, um, uh, it's not showing me the, 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 the kind of help raft here. Um, not quite right. Um, anyway, but, but I, could, I could say, let's say tree graph of this, and I could say graph, of graph layout of that. And I think that, what am I doing wrong here? Um, I'm very confused what's happening here. Let's see. Uh, my graph layout should be the nice new, um, where is our friend the spherical embedding? Oh, there we go, spherical embedding. So what's not working about this? Um, graph layout is spherical embedding. Maybe it's not possible to do a spherical embedding for this graph. Could that be? I'm very confused here. I don't know why that didn't work. Let's see if this, oh, that did manage to do a, oh, 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 silly me. This is a graph 3D embedding, no? That that's uh, well something is something is is wrong. Things are not perfect yet. Okay, that there's our spherical embedding of our graph that came from that tree. Okay. Um. Let's see. Um, okay, we're going to talk about, okay, so what can we do with trees? Uh, oh, by the way, so yeah, when we create a tree, in fact, this, let, let me show you something. This kind of shows us, if we take that tree and we say uh, tree graph, that's going to make a graph from this tree. So one interesting question is, what are the nodes of that graph called? So if we say vertex labels goes to automatic, what is going wrong here? That should work. Hmm. I'm very confused here. Okay, well, here we've got this. Let's say graph there, vertex labels um, goes to automatic. Okay, I am... I am just totally confused by what's happening here. I, I don't know what's what's going on. But but what I would like to show you here is if I say a vertex list of line one thirty six, um, you'll see that these vertices that were labeled there were, there were two vertices labeled C here. So the labels that you're putting into a tree, a tree can have labels. A tree can have two, you know, two A's in it because those A's are distinguished by their tree position, but not by their label. If this was going to go into a graph, these things have to be, the, the nodes of the graph have to be distinguished by the name of the node. And so by default, and there are a variety of different ways it can do it, tree graph will give you these essentially part numbers of those nodes as the, um, uh, um, as the way to disambiguate them as nodes of a graph. Okay, 
Well, let's see. So um, again, we can go graph tree. So we can take a graph, like carry tree is just a graph. And now we can say, make an explicit tree. If, if you have a, a graph that is a tree, you can make one of these tree objects out of it. Okay, now things start getting more interesting. What can you do that's sort of special to trees? Well, um, here's an example. Just like there's a nest graph, there's also a nest tree. So what does nest tree do? Nest tree here starts from X and at every step it generates F of X, G of X and so on. It never, even if some of those things were able to merge, it wouldn't know that. If I made, for example, let, let's say this thing here is, I don't know, hash, hash plus one. Um, and uh, let's start this off from one, for example, here. Okay, so this is, so now notice what's interesting here. Actually, this is a good example. Um, this is a tree. I'm a little bit, okay, there's a tree. But notice there were many identical elements in that tree. So this is different from nest graph. If I did this with nest graph, I would get something like that because all the twos that I'm getting here are merging with each other. Okay, so nest tree is just treeing it out all the way. And uh, okay, so then we can ask questions like, given this tree, there are many operations we can ask. We can ask things like tree depth that may not be the same as the expression depth, but it's the, um, uh, it's the depth of that tree. Um, now we can do things like we can say, given this tree, uh, let's, let's just take this tree here. Given this tree, we can say something like tree level. That's the analog of level. Let's say three, that would be all elements um, that are all subtrees that are on level three. And tree level, again, it's a tricky thing because we can, that we can ask, do you want subtrees? Do you just want the elements that appear specifically at this level? Do you want the leaves that are at that level or do you want the subtrees that start at that level? So for example, if we made a random tree, let's say a random tree with 20 elements, um, and now we say, give us the tree level of that um, comma three, for example, chances are there's, a, there's a, an isolated atom at level three, and these are subtrees. And we could tell tree level to only give us the isolated atoms at that level. Okay, another big operation is uh, tree extract. Tree extract is the analog of extract, but for tree branches. So for example, here I could say tree extract of this comma branch two two, for example, if it has one. And uh, no, it doesn't have one. Okay, let's let's go follow what it has. Let's see, two branch number two. Uh, okay, let's let's do three two here. Okay, so that will be the isolated leaf eight. And by the way, the the the, the um, this is still under development, but the things like the um, the auto sizing here will probably work better in the future. Now, what are some other things we can do? Well, here's another thing we can do. We can do, um, uh, let's see, we can do tree select, how about that? So here's a tree, and now we can say tree select, and what we're doing is we're now looking at every possible subtree here, and we're asking tree select in a list, select would just look at all the, all the elements of the list and pick out the ones that match a criterion. Here it's picking out subtrees, so this says give us all the subtrees whose tree depth is greater than two, okay? Now, uh, there's the function tree data, which um, picks out uh, the, uh, for the, uh, for the topmost node in a tree, it picks out the payload of that tree. So in that case, it's this. There are other functions like tree children that will pick out the subbranches. And tree data, you can go and you could map tree data onto deeper levels and so on. In fact, let me show you that here. Um, the next, next thing to look at actually is uh, tree map. Um, so tree map here, that's not what I wanted. Tree map, there we go. Tree map takes a function f and does just like we can map over a list. So we can also map over a tree that applies the function f to every element of a tree. 
Okay. And to get a little bit more exotic, we can um, uh, um, we can um, look at tree fold. Okay, tree fold is what's it going to do? It's going to take this function. It's going to take the function g and apply that to the leaves of the tree. And then it's going to make, um, use the function f to replace, it's going to, to treat every intermediate node of the tree as being an f application. So for example, we could probably take a random tree, a random, let's say 40 element tree here, and now we could say, let's see what happens if we say tree fold of the function f, let's say the function f is plus, and we also have a, a just a one that we're putting at every node. Let's tree fold that onto this tree. Oh, what did that do? That requires thought what that did. Um, Sorry, not so obvious what that did. I have to think about that. All right, let's 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 do at least one example of a sort of a tree. Uh, there are many, many trees in the wild uh, from you know trees that you get from importing an XML file to trees that you get representing tributaries of a river to all kinds of trees. Here's a genealogical tree. So we can say, who were the children of Queen Elizabeth, okay? And now we could do a kind of nested version of that. We can say nest tree that will create a tree by at every step saying, given Queen Elizabeth down to level two, who were the tree, who were the children of the children of the children? So this is now showing us a, um, a British monarchy tree, so to speak, um, based on uh, um, uh, based on just applying nest tree with children, uh, in this case, literal biological children, to people that we know about. Okay, so lo lots of stuff coming here. Um, not yet ready in 12.3, but, but just an awful lot of tree functionality, uh, things for dealing with special purpose kinds of trees and so on. Um, there's a, uh, okay, there's a question from DV, is it possible to match tree patterns, rewrite trees, also do so in a multi-way fashion. Um, this will be useful for term rewriting and combinators and so on. Um, trees are still so new in our system that I have not really thought all of that stuff through yet. Um, it's If it isn't there now, it will be in the future. The concept of matching a subtree, yes, in fact, this didn't quite make it, I think, into this version. But in trees, we will be able to have for example, given that you're at a tree element here, and I'm picking a particular person here, you will be say, able to say, who are the siblings of that person? Who are the cousins of that person? Who is essentially the uncle of that person? Remember that genealogical trees for humans are a little bit funky because people have two parents. Um, the, 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 um, and so, in these trees, what's happening is one parent is being shown with what their offspring are. In a, in a true ordinary genealogical tree, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Um, but uh, so, so we have these sort of relative positions in a tree, given that you're at this node, who are the cousins of that node and so on. And the concept of being able to do a rewrite where you say, given that we have this tree, this subtree, rewrite it to that subtree, Yes, that's something that should be coming. Um, and indeed, we have a bunch of that functionality that we developed for my study of combinators last year um, that uh, should be applicable to this. Uh, Seth is asking, can we get nest tree list and fold tree list in addition to nest tree and fold tree? Um, yeah, it seems like a reasonable request. I don't think we have those yet. Um, nest tree, no, we don't. And there might be a good reason for that. Let me see. The intermediate nesting of the tree 
uh, yes, I guess you can you can just generate many, just like nest list generates many different nested results. So here you generate many different partially uh, partially nested trees. Good suggestion. Uh, we should have that. All right. Uh, moving on from trees, uh, we have uh, the next thing I want to talk about was uh, kind of a detail here. This is about um, uh, dates. Maybe we can go over this quite quickly. This is um, uh, localized versions of dates. That's Swedish. Um, localized versions of... Um, uh, now, notice that there is a notion of a concept of language locale, which goes even beyond language. So that's important. And yes, we're coming to spelling dictionaries for language locales and so on. What exists now in 12.3 is the infrastructure for handling language locales. And uh, it all gets complicated as usual. Everything always gets complicated, particularly when the real world is involved. Um, we have this whole notion of date string, which can have this association where there are particular delimiters. We can say what language we're gonna use here. In this case, we're using Armenian uh, with dashes as delimiters. And that presumably is the day name in Armenian. Um, we can uh, now go ahead and um, uh, use, let's see, we're, we're taking that um, date in Armenian and the function from date string now allows us to break that into elements uh, and I guess reconstitute it in this case as um, uh, we're, we're using these delimiters and these elements from the string to essentially parse this into a date object here. Um, quick thing from Kronos on live stream. Uh, yeah, the region dilation function is equivalent to the Minkowski sum. Um, okay, so uh, so one thing is just the handling of, of locales and languages in dates and date strings. All right, now another sort of detail. Uh, we added in uh, version 10, sidereal time, um, in version 12.3, uh, uh, we're adding solar time. Why are we doing this? Well, we're heading towards being able to do astronomy uh, really well and being able to deal with all the coordinate systems and so on um, that, uh, that we deal with. And the, the, uh, if we ask for the time object here, it doesn't quite agree. It's 1523 here because of daylight savings time and because of time zones and so on. Um, and you know the longitude of us as observers and all that, our solar time doesn't agree with the with the time we get here. Actually, there may be another problem here that the that my effective uh, geolocation may be a thousand miles away from my actual location based on um, that is used to uh, that I that I set my actual computer clock from. So I may be even more off than one might otherwise be. Um, but uh, okay, another another thing we're doing that is in 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 uh, to support uh, sort of precision time for astronomy. Um, and uh, is uh, geo-orientation data. So the Earth uh, doesn't quite turn around 24, doesn't quite take 24 hours to turn around on its axis. The amount it takes to turn around is varying. That's why there are leap seconds and all those kinds of things. And what we can get here is um, what does the geo-orientation data in the year 1800, this is, um, uh, and this is telling us the, um, day duration excess at that time was minus 0.95 milliseconds. Um, and uh, um, there's a lot of detail in this geo-orientation data of where exactly is the Earth pointing. And that's important if you want to, if you're dealing with the fixed stars, you better know you're not fixed. The stars may be fixed, but you're not fixed. And that's a result of the orientation of the Earth changing. And uh, so there are all kinds of detailed things about leap second counts and, and motion of the, of, the, of the poles. I don't really know. Po let's see, what can we do here? We can ask for polar motion. Um, and uh, I don't know why this isn't auto-completing. Um, oh, can't compute it for that group going in time. Let's try now. Okay, there we go. I don't know what this quite means. 
but that's probably the the uh, the difference of the of where we think the pole of the Earth is from where the pole of the Earth actually is. All right, let's move on here. Let's talk quickly. Let's talk about neural nets. Lots of things that have been happening there, some immediately visible, some not so visible. Uh, lots of new neural nets in the neural net repository. Uh, some of them are being sort of built into super functions. There'll be a whole bunch of new super functions arriving in version, uh, version after this one. Um, and uh, in the next version um, that uh, support lots of different kinds of things. In version 12.3, um, one much requested feature is, has to do with increasing the amount of control and sort of analyzability of, um, of machine learning. So here we've got some sample data and we're going to make a predictor from it. Um, and here we've got a type of uh, a progress monitor. And um, so now we'll take that predictor that's, oh, we could have called it pred or something on that line. Um, we take our predictor and um, I think I've got an example here. Oh, I should have called it P, well, whatever. Okay, so I've got a predictor and it's a predictor for wine quality. And given that, that set of inputs, this is the predicted output based on learning from that data set. So now a question is, uh, of those things, which were the important ones in determining? How important were these different attributes of the wine in determining what this uh, wine quality score was? So one thing we added now was this notion of SHAP values. And this is showing us for each attribute here, which one really contributed to the wine quality. So the answer here is, looks like uh, chlorides is a big, chlorides and density are big contributors to wine quality from this particular uh, predictor. So SHAP values are a way of understanding that. And we can, we can go ahead if we want to, and it's useful to make a, uh, we can make a bar chart. And this is now showing us kind of, if we have a machine learning predictor, um, it's showing us what were the contributors to the actual value that was predicted. Um, which, which of those were how important, so to speak, um, the, uh, uh, for, for these things. So um, there are also are uh, various issues about, um, okay, there are issues about how missing data is handled, a lot of details about how um, things work with um, missing data. There's this notion of a recalibration function that has to do with uh, kind of, um, um, well, we, we added in, in 12.2, this notion of a calibration curve. Given that a predictor, uh, given that a classifier uh, said there were certain probabilities of certain outcomes, how accurate were those probabilities based on training data? And can you recalibrate those probabilities? And now there's the notion of a recalibration function, which controls that recalibration process. So let's see, other things we've done, enhanced Onyx import and export for, um, uh, for importing and exporting neural nets. Um, and uh, as I mentioned at the beginning here, well, one, I, I said one of the things that's holding up, having a native Apple Silicon version um, the, uh, uh, for 12.3 is some things to do with neural nets. We are porting the low level neural net framework that we use to Apple Silicon, and that should be finished very soon. I believe there are test versions, was said earlier, um, uh, available already. Um, let's see, details about feature extractors. Um, another area that we've been steadily enhancing is text cases. So text cases, we've added a bunch of new entity types to text cases. So now this is asking for board games in this sentence. Uh, what were the board games that were found in that sentence? So we can now do that. Okay, something that is rapidly merging with machine learning, but is its own thing for now, is uh, video. Um, we've added a bunch of new ways to generate videos. Um, so one, uh, one is a slideshow video. So this slideshow video will generate a video here. 
Um, and now here's our video, let's make it a bit bigger. And that will be a slideshow that came from those three slide images. And it will, I told it to take one second per image. So that this is now a convenient way to make a slideshow from a bunch of images and you can control how much time is spent in each slide and so on. So that's one new sort of video generator. Another new video generator is an animation video. So here we're just taking a plot that is uh, that, that has a parameter A in it. This is like animate, but now what's happening is it's instead of just generating an in product, in system uh, animation, uh, it's generating a, a video that um, exists external to the system and come on, wake up, do your thing. Um, I'm again, I'm, I'm slightly concerned that I sort of blew up this session earlier by doing um, having lots of velvet rabbits jump around. Um, oh my, come on. What is this doing? Bad demo here. All right, in, in um, what's happening here? I don't know why this is happening. I'm going to make one attempt. Huh. Oh, so sad. Well, I'm going to, as I say, I think I, I really blew things up and this is probably another big GPU user. Um, all right, let's, let's do this. When in doubt, let's, let's actually start a, um, another instance. I probably have ways to start more local instances here, but let me go ahead and start one of these as a Mathematica. Um, let me go to 200% here and um, just show you. Um, Just open something up here. Um, sorry about this. Okay. So uh, let's see, let me go and I don't know what's happened to this over here, but let's just leave that quietly humming along to itself or or killing itself. I don't really know which, but let's um, let me try doing that again here. So now I've got an animation video and I'm going to try and generate that animation with, okay, here we go. This is looking much better. I don't know what's going on over there. I really blew something up over there. Um, so this is now showing our new progress monitor, generating video frames. Um, it's, uh, you know, we're, it's, it's a serious piece of CPU usage and GPU usage to generate video frames, but there I've got the result. Let me now go and um, open up that video. And now I've got just directly from my animation here, I have created a video. I think that's pretty nice. I expect to be using that a whole bunch. Um, we've got some other kinds of video generators. Another one is video record. Um, and I don't think that will work for what I'm doing right now because I'm using, oh, it might work. Uh, I'm using my default uh, imaging device for, uh, for this um, uh, live stream. So I think I, I won't be able to use it to capture uh, me waving at it or anything. Um, but um, the video record allows you to capture from a video device. Coming in a future version will be something directly analogous to uh, image capture and audio capture, but that has, isn't quite ready for 12.3. Okay. Um, all right, let's take a look now at, um, oh, another thing that's happened is that we have this idea of, um, we have the possibility of um, parallelizing. Um, so let's go ahead and say uh, something like parallelize. 
video frame map. And let's just say something like um, uh, color, color negate um, of, um, uh, so that's video frame map that, and let's say of line one. So this is now going to, uh, uh, oh boy, this is going to launch a whole, launch a lot of kernels for me. This is, by the way, you're noticing another new progress monitor. This is the kernel launching progress monitor. Um, this is now launching uh, the various parallel kernels that I have access to. Um, so this is uh, this is showing this is dealing with launched, collected, expected. So this is um, saying um, how many have been. Okay, how many have been launched? Oh wow, that was so fast. That's what happens when you run on 157 machines. So that parallelized the updating of every frame. So now we've got a dark mode video that we just generated by color negation. Um, that is not, hold on one second here. Let's just put this in a sensible place. Um, okay, all right. Well, there's things like video time stretch, um, uh, all sorts of things like that. Uh, for videos, but um, we're, we're working towards really rich treatment of videos, particularly in machine learning and so on. Um, and uh, okay, let's see. All right, let's go on to a different area. Let's go on to chemistry. So what's new in chemistry? By the way, did this ever finish? This never finished. What's new in chemistry? Um, we have been steadily uh, uh, continuing with that. So this is now a tautomer list for a particular molecule. And um, what went wrong there? Let's see whether that molecule is still alive and well after it's been reconstituted here. Oh, dear, dear, dear. Well, so much for that. Let's make, okay, who knows a molecule? I don't know whether there are meaningful tautomers of uh, let's make a molecule of caffeine, for example. Um, and then let's say the tautomer list of that, which um, so sad, there's nothing it can do. Uh, I think I should know my molecules better. Um, all right, another thing that's new is the function molecule name. Um, so that gives you uh, the name, okay, it's, it's querying lots of different sources to try to find a name for this molecule. I, I, you know, because I always live dangerously, I'm just gonna put some extra little branching in here, see whether that thing has a name. Wait a minute, how can that have the same name? That's a different molecule, isn't it? Unless I don't know my smiles well, I would have thought that was a different molecule. Let's try putting something in there. Huh. Well, let's see if that's actually a differently shaped molecule. Let's say molecule of that. And then let's say molecule plot 3D. Of that. And now let's go back up to this one here. And we can say molecule plot 3D of that. Maybe it's the same. I, I don't know if this is the same molecule. Who knows? Okay, so in any case, but this is, this is attempting to find a name for a molecule that you have created, either as a smile string or something else. Okay, so the place where it gets really cool is that you can take molecule recognize. So let's, um, ah yes, let's use molecule align to test if they're the same. Uh, 11 and 12. Okay, so molecule align of 7 and 10. I think you can just do this, if I remember correctly. Is that right? Is that aligning one molecule into the other molecule, I think? Um, so I don't quite know how to read that result. 
But uh, let, let's try something different. So let's say web image search uh, chemical structure diagram. And let's just get a few chemical structure diagrams and then we're gonna try doing something nifty. Um, if I can bring in some images here from the web. Okay, let's try. Okay, this is gonna be outrageously complicated, but let's see if this can, well, let's, see, let's just try that one. That one is a little bit more modest. Okay, so now we've got a picture of a molecule. And now let's say, I don't know if this is high enough resolution, but let's say we say molecule recognize of that. Drum roll. Huh. Well, okay, it just got the squiggle. Well, it looks like it just got the squiggle. It didn't get, um, uh, don't think it got the whole thing. Oh, how funny, how funny. It got the outer border as a collection of carbon atoms. So, okay, so this is drawing in carbon, so to speak. We hope to be able to do that one of these days. Let's maybe take this one here. That's a nice, nice big one, a high resolution. I mean, I was just showing the thumbnails, which really wasn't fair there. So let's try molecule recognize of this thing. Um, again, it's probably got a non-standard drawing of this, but at least it's finding out it's got a carbon and eight, hy eight, eight hydrogens. Wait a minute, that's not right. The, okay, I, I should, all right, just, just in order to actually make it work in a good way, let me um, let me just. Uh, um, I just want to actually try something just to see what's actually involved. Um, let's see data set, and then let's say uh, max items arrow four or something. So this hopefully will bring back a data set that will contain actual links to the. Um, the various places. Okay, so let's try, wow, okay. Well, I don't know what that one is, but image hyperlink. Um, so let's get our image here. Oh, that was a PNG. Okay, beautiful PNG. Let's try pulling that PNG in here. Let's try, okay, well, so this is a little bit funky. So this molecule recognize, I wouldn't expect to work perfectly, but let's just see what happens if I say molecule recognize of that image. Um, my goal here was to show you a molecule sort of being recognized from the wild and then being able to ask the name of that uh, molecule. Um, and so we'll see whether this up. Oh, wow. What is that thing? Okay, let's see. Molecule plot. Let's say, let's just say molecule plot of that. Oh, it did a pretty good job there. Well, I wonder what happens if I say molecule name. I don't know what these are. See, see, this is what happens. Drawing in carbon is kind of a losing proposition, I think. Um, but uh, we've got a pretty good molecule here, and we might be able to get names for it if we really, uh, if we really pushed harder. We probably need some functions, some utility functions to like take disconnected molecules and rent and, and treat them as separate. Okay, other things we've got. We've got this notion of, um, uh, okay, there was an example of molecule recognize and molecule name. Okay, there we go. Um, we've also got um, molecule maximum common substructure. So with strings, you can do string alignment and say, what's the maximum common substring between these two strings? This tells us, oh boy, these molecules didn't come in in the correct form. This should have told us what the common, uh, what the largest common lump of molecule is between these two molecules. Okay, so actually let's take a look at molecule align. I think we might have an example here that might work. Oh, no, it doesn't work. Well, I've got another idea how to make that work. Let's see, let's try this. Wow, okay, let's try doing this. Okay, molecule, molecule, oops. Okay, those are two molecules. And now we're going to, oh, we had a common substructure up here. We need to know 
what the common substructure was between these molecules. And then we're going to align these two molecules on their common substructure and get a kind of a composite molecule, a, a, a way that's showing how these two molecules would align or, for example, dock with each other um, in, in uh, um, um, in in um, in the in the system. So another thing that we've got is let's take one of these molecules. We've also got some machine learning capabilities from these molecules. Um, we should have. I'm not sure if we can just do this. Um, we might be able to. Okay. Uh, maybe we can do this. Um, uh, we've now got new. Um, uh, feature extractors that are specialized to molecules. And, uh, okay, that wasn't very interesting. Um, but in any case, so that means that you can put molecules into feature space plots and expect to have things like that work. Um, okay. Well, let's see. We've got, we, we're, we're getting through here. We, we've got quite a bit um, more that we can talk about. But, um, uh, and um, um, the uh, yeah, it's it's uh, the, the, our treatment of chemistry in in Wolfram language is pretty serious at this point, and it's going to get even more serious. And the treatment of chemistry in Wolfram Alpha is also good and contains a lot of stuff that isn't in Wolfram language because it's special case things for you know step by step chemistry and so on. But uh, this is this is starting to be a very serious chemistry system, and uh, actually, for me personally, I'm keen to use it because I have a sort of theory about chemical comp molecular scale computation that I'm hoping to sort of test in some reality with uh, um, with the chemistry that we have in Morphine language. Okay, going also in the real world, let's talk about control systems. Very different area. This is. Um, um, so, uh, one of the things that we've had now for several versions is the ability to hook up to our system modeler product and import complete systems engineering systems into Wolfram language. So this is going to take a little while to sort of clear its throat here, but this is kind of a, um, uh, a, a, a system that represents kind of a toy, or maybe it's a real submarine. Um, and it's going to be the, uh, the kind of the, the, it's going to be a representation of what's ultimately underneath differential algebraic equations that represent a particular kind of system. Um, and so uh, I'm going to, why is this taking so long? I, am, I think I'm going to force quit that other version here that is just horrifying. Um, okay, so hopefully this will wake up and show us, there we go. Okay, we finally got our submarine. Uh, thing. So now this represents a system, represents a system of equations. I could ask it um, what those equations are probably. Uh, let's see. Um, I forget how to ask it that, but let's, let's go ahead and for example, just say plot that system. Um, what just happened here? Yeah. It's very confusing. Oh, what's going on? Hmm. Uh, what on earth is happening? This suggests that the problem is with my little cheat that allows me to autotype these, um, uh, these things. Let's see what happens if I abort that. Well, let's see what happens here. Um, and now I think I may be restarted. Okay, well, let's try the submarine again. Oh boy, it has to, it has to restart the, um, uh, the system for doing system modeling. But let's go ahead and press this button here and see whether I can get it to do, oh, wow. Oh, dynamic updating is disabled because I just disabled it. Uh, silly me. Okay, dynamic updating enabled.
Um, uh, Ethan is asking about is uh, uh, alpha fold and things like that coming to the uh, neural net repository. Uh, I think that is a good suggestion and there certainly are some folding networks that we could imagine adding. And that's a good, that's a good idea. Um, I, I could have shown you as, as uh, in version 12.2, we added biosequences and there's lots more that's coming for the next version related to biosequences. All right, let's just see. Oh, come on. Come on. I really would like to show you this. So I, I, want, to, I want to see if I can get this to work. All right. When in doubt. Okay, something is really broken here. And I have a feeling it's to do not with the actual uh, system that you all can download, but has to do with my little cheat here for, um, uh, for being able to autotype things. Uh, whew, it's crazy. Okay. That was really weird. Um, all right, I'm actually going to quit this and I'm going to try be starting here and um, see whether I have better luck. Um, and let me go ahead and open recent. Oh no, I can't open that from there. Let me see. Um, okay. That's interesting. That's very unpromising that did that. Okay, let's go down to the bottom here and let's try this one more time. Actually, let me just try. Uh, just try pasting the thing that I wanted to paste here. And um, Then if this doesn't work, we'll have to. That worked. Very weird. Okay, let's let's evaluate this, create this system again. And then what I'm going to do is this system model plot is going to actually do the simulation of this uh, systems engineering system that's defined by probably maybe a few hundred equations, differential equations. And this is now going to simulate that for a particular set of inputs. So it's, it's like you kick the submarine and make it do something, okay? Hopefully we're gonna get our submarine back well, unless the submarine has sunk. Um, no, the submarine has, a, maybe the submarine has sunk. Um, maybe the submarine is sinking us. I don't know what's going on here. Um, The, uh, all right, there's our submarine. Okay, now finally, let me try to run the simulation of the submarine. So it's now uh, actually having to, uh, you know, it's, it's essentially compiling the equations about the submarine to actually be able to compute um, the, uh, the results here. And hopefully this will run and give us the results. Come on. All right, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go mega wimp out here. Um, no, this doesn't make sense. This should be, this should be almost, oh, there we go. Okay, finally computed for our submarine. If you kick the submarine, the submarine's gonna oscillate around uh, before, um, okay. So now the big question is, uh, this submarine has a controller in it. That this, this diagram, I, I don't know exactly where it is, and I'd have to drill down to see that. This, this has a representation of a, of a controller um, that is some kind of PID controller, I think, in this case, that is trying to uh, keep the submarine, that's trying to prevent the submarine from moving too much. Now, in, in fact, this controller has this oscillatory behavior. Oh, come on, what's going on here?
what on earth is happening to this? I don't know what's happening here. Okay, well, I don't know what this is gonna do. A little disappointing. Okay, so actually, no, I, I, sh I, I misspoke. The, the submarine as originally set up is just a submarine. And when you kind of push it, it will oscillate like this. The question is, can you make a controller that when you push it, the fins of the submarine will flap around to try and prevent the submarine from doing this oscillatory motion? Uh, think about it like sort of the flight controller of a drone or something like that. You push on the drone. Can you get it to run the rotors faster or slower to get it to restabilize itself? Um, this is crazy. This is crazy. What's happening here? I do not understand what's happening. This is very weird. Okay. Well, I'm going to delete that cell and maybe that will stop the thing running crazy dynamic stuff. Um, and, uh, okay. The big event here is to actually create a control system. And we have the wherewithal to do that. This is a thing that will create a, uh, a control system. I guess this is, um, uh, this is going to create a controller that is trying to control it in uh, trying to maintain the, let's see, this is the zeros or the poles, I think, of the transfer function, if I'm not mistaken, for the system. And so by pushing this, putting this inside the unit circle, I think we are trying to set it up so that we have a controlled system. And um, now what should be happening, I don't know why on earth it's so slow, um, is, uh, okay. Right, it's, it's linearizing the model apparently, and then it is trying to find a controller for that linearized model um, that, uh, um, uh, that will, will do this. And I, I think another time somebody who really knows control systems should be, um, uh, should be doing, uh, should be showing you all how all this works because this is not my area of expertise. Um, and, oh, this is just, Crazy broken. All right, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna skip out of this section here. Um, the uh, let me just wimp out completely and show you the. Um, uh, oh, I'm very disappointed by this. This is not what should have happened. Um, I don't know what's doing. I'm going to I'm just going to for the sake of of safety and in, in the other things we're doing. I'm just going to restart this. Uh, and uh, let me just, as my wimp out, let me show you. Um, um, let me just show you the uh, the post that I wrote about this, which contains a little bit more information. Um, so this is showing the design of this controller. Um, and eventually it's showing how you can insert the controller into the system and see that that submarine that was oscillating around is now its fins are flapping to the point where it is just coming smoothly back to the original control point. And one can imagine doing this kind of thing for an economic system, as well as for the kinds of systems that we're defining in system modeler and uh, the systems engineering systems. Now here, um, what we're doing is to create a version of this controller that we can export to an Arduino. So if we had a submarine, uh, like a toy submarine, and we could actually download the C code to an Arduino that is the controller inside the toy submarine, and it would do the things that we've been showing here um, and uh, maintain control. So that's, a, that's kind of exciting that we can go all the way from this kind of very theoretical um, uh, version of um, a control system all the way to actually uh, from, a, from a system to find a controller 
for the linearized version of that system to actually generating the Arduino code to implement that controller. Okay, so much for that story. All right, let me, um, uh, let me turn to a different story. Uh, this is about typing in notebooks, okay? So there's, there's something interesting that we've done here. So you may know if I type dash greater than, it turns into a rule, okay? If I type vertical bar dash greater than, it turns into a nice function function. Um, these are things we've had. Now, a new thing that's happened is what we call, uh, it's kind of a ligatures mechanism. So if I type open square bracket, double square bracket, I will get the actual nice looking square brackety things um, that we use for part brackets. And that means that if you have a, um, uh, let's see, if you have, um, uh, something that looks like, let's see if I can open this up. Um, if you have something that, um, oh, I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to type this here. Yeah, if I, if I, if I were to show this in a previous version, those uh, part brackets would look like double brackets and it would be significantly harder to read this expression. So, okay, so now what's happened is this is actually a very general mechanism for what we call, um, uh, this is a, a mechanism for auto operator renderings. So let, let's just see how it works. If I type A, open bracket, open bracket, now I type a backspace, I will get back to single brackets again. Um, the same thing works with, um, uh, with association brackets and things like that. But this is now a general mechanism that what's actually stored in the file, if I were to look at what actually are the characters there, um, if I go Command Shift E and I look, what are the characters there? There's actually two brackets there. It is merely in the, in the process of rendering that this has been turned into a nice looking part bracket. Okay, but much more important in my opinion, uh, than that is something that you've been seeing me do throughout the session. I type F, I type an open square bracket. Guess what? The closed bracket is typed at the same time. So I type an X plus G of open bracket. The closed bracket is typed at the same time. Isn't that cool? You, you, are, you are going to get typically match brackets here. Now, if you know how you used to type you will just type a closed bracket here. When you type a closed bracket, it will essentially type through the bracket that is there. So if all you know is the old way to type, nothing will change. But in fact, you don't need to type that closed bracket. You can just click outside or you can arrow outside and the bracket will already be closed. Um, the, uh, now, this feature, we're still a little bit nervous about this feature, so it is not turned on by default. Um, you can uh, turn it on with that command, or you can go to the um, uh, preferences dialog. Let me show you how to do that. You go to the preferences dialog, and under interface, there should be something that says automatically insert matching delimiters while typing. Just check that box. If I uncheck that box, I don't want to uncheck that box. I really need, like this feature. Then I type F bracket. This is the default behavior. If I now uh, check that box and now I type my F bracket again, it'll do this. Okay, this feature is very subtle because in the case that I'm looking at here where I've typed to the end of a line and something is going to happen, then it's all good. But if I go in and edit inside here, it is much less clear where the closed bracket should go. And for this version, we're being very conservative in how we add matching brackets. So this will work when you're forward typing and you're at the end of a line, for example, or in some cases where you're adding to where the cursor currently is, um, it will do it. We're steadily working through the heuristics and the rules and the cases to see how we can generalize that to let one do, uh, do this kind of auto matching, even when you type inside an expression. But I think this is a great feature and I'm really looking forward to, to being able to use it. 
And, uh, you know, it'll work with all kinds of delimiters, braces, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Never type an unmatched delimiter again is the basic concept of this. And okay, there it punted because it decided it didn't know what was going on. And now I have to manually add that close brace. Okay, another big thing is uh, the beginnings of a mechanism that we call code assistance, okay? So this is a, this is an if statement. Notice that in this if statement, we um, have, uh, where is it? Oh, there we go, yeah, okay. In this if statement, uh, we have a double, a repeated then else clause. Okay, there is a new menu item, analyze cell. Let's try running that. And there we go, there's the result. Oh, why doesn't this magnify properly? Sorry, this is not magnifying very well. Okay, what we see here is the code analysis. We see, see that little one there that should have been magnified that says there's one comment about your code. What does it say? It says both branches of if are the same. So if I go click on this, it says um, uh, I can do various things. I can ignore that. Sometimes it will give me a, this is a thing you can do. So the concept is, and you can do this for a whole, uh, here's, here's a case for a switch. So this is a switch here. And now I can say, go ahead and analyze cell. And now it'll do this analysis. And now it's telling me that this uh, true is probably wrong for the switch. That probably should be a, a blank because switch is, is uh, um, is using pattern matching, not using uh, uh, tests. And so now it has, it says this is a warning and then it says replace true with blank. And now I can say apply edits and I'll get the result. Okay, this is just the beginning of a huge project to do sort of general code assistance. And kind of the notion is this, pretty much anything I type in that's syntactically correct is a conceivable program but it may be a deeply unlikely program to be the correct program. And our goal here is by rules and machine learning and heuristics to be able to tell people, I don't think your program is correct, and then make suggestions about what you would do to make it more correct. And this is going to eventually get plugged in. Right now, it's just plugged in as a sort of opt-in mechanism where you go select code analysis and it goes and does the code analysis. You can do code analysis for a whole notebook as well. Um, increasingly, it will be hooked in to work more like a spell checker and to work much more automatically on code or to work when you generate messages and at runtime to run in that case and say, these are the things that might be wrong with the code. Um, the, uh, okay, Capallo is making a comment about any variable which was previously followed by a double bracket is almost certainly safe to double bracket again. So what you're saying is if I see A and it's got double brackets, and then I see another, and then I put inside here plus A, double bracket, double bracket. Well, okay, in that case, it, it did do the double, double bracketing. I'm not, I'm not sure about this heuristic. It's interesting, we'll throw that into the heuristic bin. Um, I, I've not, um, uh, there's, there's much more to figure out in this area. Um, okay, so let me just comment that code analysis, we've run this code analysis system on our own internal uh, Wolfram language code and we found a bunch of bugs. And um, you know, this is a typical example of a bug we found. This was a piece of code that was in the system somewhere. We run code analysis on it, um, and uh, uh, I don't know why it doesn't have a progress monitor here. It should have a progress monitor. That's a bug, I would say. I don't know what it's doing here. Maybe it's, maybe oh, maybe this was the already corrected piece of code, or maybe this was, um, but the basic point is this, well, why didn't this, what did this just do? Analyze cell. Come on, wake up, analyze cell. Um, Anyway, this piece of code has a bug in it. And that's a piece of code, something that we found by this kind of automated linting type process on our own code. 
Okay. Well, let's talk about the compiler. In fact, Ali was just asking about the compiler. The compiler has been progressing. The compiler is a very complicated project. You will see much more in versions coming very soon uh, in the compiler. But a very important thing that's happened in the compiler in this version is something that I thought was kind of obvious, but took a while for me to push to get this to happen. It's the following thing. To make the compiler uh, compile not just for the platform you're on, but for all possible platforms. So in other words, we've got this piece of compiled code. Let's be able to pick up that code and even in a completely different session, be able to run that piece of code. Um, and so there are two issues here. So this compiled code is machine code at the bottom. You can, you can see what it actually is if you really want to. But the important thing that's new is the following thing. So there's the notion of a, uh, a, a target system. Okay, so target system um, is, let's see if I say target system is all, this will take a bit longer because this is now creating optimized intermediate rep, LLVM, intermediate representation, optimized for all the different kinds of, uh, uh, of systems that we support. So it might take, I don't know, it might even take five times longer here. You know, something we should do, I hadn't even, um, um, this is something that should work, guys who are taking notes. Parallelization of this should just work. Um, in fact, arguably, this should use multiple threads if it can do so. But um, uh, let's just take this. Um, Ethan is asking, is parallel map finally monitored? It didn't quite make it into this version. Um, it's, uh, um, oh, apparently parallelization of compilation has now been fixed, um, but it isn't in, in the, it's going to probably be Packlet updated. Uh, okay, so now this is, let's see, we want the compiled IR from this. Um, okay, so what you see there, is these are, these are the pieces of compiled code as byte arrays for all these different platforms, uh, including a 32-bit platform, some 64-bit platforms, and so on. And there's Mac OS X ARM64. There's the compiled code for it. Um, let's see. So uh, what, I mean, this is, this is, so one thing that's important about this is it means that, for example, in the function repository, you can have compiled code and the compiled code will just work on all these different platforms. Um, there is a slight wrinkle in this, which is that there is still, um, when the code is loaded on a, on a different platform, this intermediate representation still has to locally convert it to final local machine code from the intermediate representation. That's a pretty fast operation, but you can avoid that operation if you embed the libraries from specific machines. Unfortunately, that's not something that can be done in a, um, uh, in a, in a, um, um, uh, can, it, it can't be done preemptively on your machine. You actually need the libraries from a particular machine. So we've actually been working on a compilation as a service mechanism for doing that, although it's not clear how important it is because the, the rehydration of, a, of, a, um, uh, of an intermediate representation LLVM uh, piece of code is really very fast. There are other things happening in the compiler. Integer 128 is now supported. There's a whole elaborate mechanism to do with compiler environment objects. It looks very kind of technical and low level, but it's part of supporting the compile the compiler project, um, which is still underway. And what you'll see in the next version, just like we've seen data structures as a way to leverage the value of the compiler, you'll see some sort of low level intermediate code that is accessible from the top level that allows you to get, to get things running uh, much faster by giving the system more information on exa about exactly how you want to run beyond the problem of data structure um, is um, uh, the um, uh, be beyond beyond what you can do with data structure. You'll be able to do more things that are sort of a code analog of this sort of low level control of data structures. Okay. What else? Well, there's some other things. I'm, I'm almost, almost done here. Uh, external evaluation. 
So we've now, we've added to the list of languages that are supported in external evaluate. Um, and you can see that here. So for example, we've added shell. So I can now say date here, and that will actually, uh, that will generate the date and produce success there. I can say, what was the standard output here? I think that's the right thing to ask for. And it will tell me the standard output from the success object. So that's a, um, I'm, I'm sure I can. So now we can, you can, you can just use the shell. Back in the day in version one, you would type an exclam at the beginning of a, a, um, uh, a terminal command line. And you can still do that in the terminal version of uh, Wolfram Engine and so on. But now this is the modernized notebookified version of that. Uh, we've also got, um, uh, we've also support Octave as a, um, uh, as one of these um, languages, let me see. I, I don't know any. I don't know what you write in this. What? Let's see what happens if we do this. So it does nothing. What does that do? Okay. Well, it probably takes the power there, but it did it numerically, and it brought back the result there. Uh, so that's another thing. Um, now, uh, let's see. We can. Um, uh, okay, a bit of sort of fancier stuff. We can now deal with Java here. Oh, great. Okay, well, so much for that idea. Um, let me see if this can possibly work. I think it cannot. No, okay, so what I have to do here is put it in my mouse, select Java, and paste it out here. And I'm afraid I don't know Java, so I don't know what this does. But I guess this is running Java and it's asking for um, the Java version here. Um, and now you can do the same kind of thing. We can ask for, um, we can take, um, uh, let's see, we can create a new object in Java. And now that will be converted back to Wolfram language here. Um, and uh, you can create, oh boy, how does this work? You can create a Java object in Wolfram language. Let's see, this is creating, what is this doing? This is creating some kind of Java object, which you can then, I claim, use in, yes, you can now import it here and then use it in this piece of Java code that you're running here. This will create an external function running inside Java that you can then apply to, um, let's see, how does this work? We can say that external function applied to values, and then we're going to give it this format object here, and it's going to format those things. That was an awfully difficult way to do that. But if you insist on, you know, this, obviously this is much more interesting if you have an existing uh, uh, corpus of, of, of Java code. Okay, we're, we're almost at the end here, but I just want to mention a few more things. Um, blockchain, we've been continuing to advance in, in doing things with blockchain. Um, there's actually much more to come there. In this version, we support now the Tezos blockchain. Um, and uh, we announced recently, we're also gonna be supporting the Cardano blockchain. Um, this is now trying to find the latest, um, uh, okay, that's the latest block mined on the Tezos blockchain. Um, a lot of technical detail here to do with um, uh, supporting, well, there's supporting a bunch of new cryptography um, that relates to the various kinds of, um, Okay, so, so here, for example, we have um, uh, encoding for Tezos, for a Tezos address, a public key, which has been set up using an Edwards curve, elliptic curve. That's, um, these are just sort of um, um, uh, fancy things for, um, um, uh, for dealing with the kind of cryptography that's needed for modern blockchains. Ethan is asking for adding crypto exchanges to financial data. We do have some, we have 
end of day crypto, uh, um, I believe we have, if I say, you know, three Bitcoin, um, I believe that we can say uh, currency convert that to US dollars. I think that will work. Yes, it does work. But that's only um, uh, um, but that's only end of day. Uh, Ethan is asking about importing the price time series of coins. Yes, we're well aware of this issue. We are working on it. We have a, a number of reasons, uh, internal reasons actually, why we really care about this right now. Um, and uh, uh, we're working towards a pretty serious effort in um, blockchain analytics. Um, and uh, you can expect to see more of those things soon. It's a, more complicated than you expect because uh, you know, some exchanges have APIs, some do not. The, the question of what is the value of, of Bitcoin in US dollars? Um, uh, well, uh, Bitcoin, it's probably very close to the same on all the different exchanges. In, um, in the case of a, a more thinly traded cryptocurrency, it might actually have a significant spread between different exchanges. In addition, as we look at distributed uh, uh, solutions, distributed um, finance solutions, where you don't have a centralized exchange, you have a distributed exchange um, where there's a sort of tokenized liquidity pool and so on, that's a, a more complicated story that uh, is probably a large part of the future. And we want to be able to support being able to get time series from uh, distributed exchanges and so on as well. So there's, there's some complexity to that. Uh, okay, other things that have come here, um, external storage objects now support Amazon S3. That's a very convenient thing because they're with the um, um, uh, external batch submit, that what we finally called it. Um, I have forgotten what, um, it, this is the problem with functions that get renamed multiple times before they're released is that I sometimes remember the, uh, the previous name, but um, we have the capability to submit batch jobs to Amazon. Uh, we can now support storage on Amazon as we can also support storage in the IPFS Filecoin ecosystem. Okay, another thing that sounds like a detail, but it's a very important in practice is the support for OS, OAuth 2.0. Um, that's been necessary for some of our single sign-on capabilities for large organizations using our products. It's also convenient for many kinds of APIs that we now support and secured authentication key, we now support OAuth 2. Again, sounds like a detail, but it's actually pretty important for, for practical usage. Okay, final thing I'll mention here is uh, the modernization of the distributed computing mechanisms. Um, and let's see, I wonder whether I can actually do this on my machines here. Um, let's see whether this actually makes sense. Uh, well, let's see, launch kernels. Is this gonna work? Is this going to work? Oh, it did work. Fantastic. Okay, so this is a symbolic remote kernel object. And the point now is that we can do things like, okay, we can now say remote evaluate of, with respect to this remote kernel object of dollar machine name, let's say. And it says it's Threadripper 2. And let me say, for example, process account. How many processors does Threadripper 2 have? And process account, um, it's got 64 processors. And so now this is now running a, this is now using a kernel object to specify the target of the remote evaluate. Um, and uh, that's a, um, uh, that's, that's sort of a, a, a story there. Okay, final thing I'll mention. Again, we're really now getting somewhat into the weeds here. Um, uh, oh yes, I, I should mention uh, as part of the whole OAuth 2.0 thing, in uh, the end of June, there will be support for desktop products to use single sign-on. So uh, sites, universities, other places that use single sign-on, um, 
it will be possible to authenticate a desktop version of Wolfram Language and Wolfram One or Mathematica from directly from your single sign-on web signed on. Uh, when you sign on to your network, the it will give you the wherewithal to to activate your uh, local um, uh, your local desktop version of Wolfram Language. Um, okay, so there's a question from Ethan. What is running on Threadripper that is the other end of this? I suspect it is a uh, WSTP server, the persistent uh, Wolfram engine that we released. Um, that is kind of the minimal thing that accepts kernel requests. And that's what I think is running there, but it may say what's running there. Uh, no, it doesn't. I'm, I'm guessing that this is running the um, uh, WSTP server and that that's what gets activated on that machine through SSH when, uh, when I launch kernels on this remote kernel object. Um, okay, final thing I want to mention. Um, oh, okay. Uh, Jesse is pointing out, if it were WSTP server, it wouldn't say SSH, it would say WSTP colon. Very good point. So this is running uh, through some SSH tunnel, some kind of kernel, I don't know exactly what it is. Um, and uh, so I'm guessing here it is just launching the, the Wolfram function, which is just the, um, the, the, the raw kernel, I think. Um, all of that stuff is configurable. And uh, one thing that's coming, but not yet there, is an updated version of the kernel configuration options um, uh, in here that will support all of these things in a nice, clean, modern way. But this has been a long time coming. This is the kernel connection manager system. It's been in gestation for many years. It's now finally uh, almost born in, um, uh, uh, in version 12.3. Okay, final comments here. This is now, we're now getting deep into the weeds. The function with lock. Okay, with lock has to do with the following issue. Let's say that you have multiple processes running, perhaps parallel kernels. They're all trying to access one file. Oops, they, if they access the file at the same time, the file could get corrupted. So what with lock does is it allows you to lock relative to a, um, it allows you to specify a lock for remote, um, uh, for, for a kernel, uh, you can specify, let me show you this. I, I told you this is, this is really getting pretty deep in the weeds. Um, this is something that is saying, okay, parallel evaluate. Okay, what is this doing? Oh. Okay, okay, okay. This is so with lock allows you to explicitly specify that you want a particular file to be used as the as the sort of locking uh, anchor for making atomicity of some operation. So what's happening here is you're saying parallel evaluate with lock of this file lock, do an operation. What that means is if there is writing to this file, then that is being done in parallel by this expression here being evaluated, then make the then lock things so that those evaluations don't happen at the same time, that the evaluations are locked by what is being done to the file. So, and that mechanism is being used at a higher level in local symbol to prevent local symbol from being overwritten. Um, and that's, uh, that's part of that story. So uh, this is something which solves a bunch of problems with data drop, it solves a bunch of other problems. It is a piece of atomicity that's being added to the system that um, uh, helps with, <clears throat> with parallel access to resources. All right.
And that is about it. I'm sure there are other things in version 12.3 that I have not mentioned, but that's a, um, uh, a he says, quick, what was that, three hours later, um, a tour of what's new in version three, uh, version 12.3, and what we've been up to for the last five months. Um, I would say that there's a, a, a torrent of stuff coming uh, for the next version. Um, and uh, there's a lot of, um, uh, of things that are nearing completion, but we decided we wanted to get 12.3 out so that you all could have access to all these nice new things that we've been building sooner rather than later. Uh, the next version will contain the things that we're building now. And uh, please join us for live streams where we explore the design of things that are being built for the version after this one. Um, now, I think we are also planning uh, people who are interested in fix that bug, uh, you know, do this, do this, um, uh, uh, enable this kind of computation and so on. Uh, we are planning a session to go over those kinds of things. And perhaps we should also plan, if people are interested, a general Q&A session about uh, the state of orphan language and, um, uh, and directions that we're going. But um, uh, I think, um, I think we've probably exhausted everybody here. And uh, I know I'm getting hungry here. So it's, um, uh, I think it's probably time to wrap up this session. Um, and uh, thank you very much for joining us. And uh, look forward to seeing you another time.